call, please. Mr. Jimenez. Here, Alcalde. Morales. Morales. Cohen. Here. Roscoe. Esparza. Here. Arenas. Here. Foley. Here. Mahan. Here. Jones. Present. Licardo. Present. Davis is here too. I didn't hear you say my name, Tony. Thank you. Sorry. I was dealing with other background things at the same time as calling roll. I may have skipped you on accident, um, but we have a quorum. Okay. Tony, are you able to hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'm sorry for that trouble. I'm sorry for that trouble. We're hearing uh, an echo, Sam. We're hearing you 12. Yeah, that's good. that's good. We just want to hear you one. Got it. Yeah, I know it's it's hard enough hearing me one. All right. So I'm now back this, with you. Let's jump on and, another thing to see if we get back. This is Tony, this is Tony Tabor, City Clerk. I just wanted to remind you guys that we have interpretation. And if you want to hear um, interpretation, you switch from the English or Spanish, Vietnamese, or Chinese channels. Great, thank you very much, Tony. All right, we uh, last left off with report of the city manager. Uh, I wanna to go to public comment. Uh, Mr. Soto. Uh, Mr. Sykes, um, I wanted to thank you on behalf of my ancestors and on behalf of the Chicanos the segment of the population of the Chicanos that are descendants of Sasipuedes, I want to thank you for having the racial equity session. That was, this was, you were pivotal in centering for the first time my history and the history of literally hundreds of thousands of Mexicans that suffered under those policies since July 14, 1846. And you provided this, the proper space which is the center of power and acknowledged that this happened. When I was sitting in that audience, there was elders inside the audience that were quietly weeping. And I know why they were weeping. It was because for the first time, they were given vindication and understanding that this, yes, did happen to us. And so I wanna thank you for that. And thank you for all the work that you've done for our city. All right, thank you. Blair? Hi, thank you, uh, Blair Beekman. Um, I first started coming to city council meetings in 2014. Uh, David Sykes was an assistant manager then, and he would be at all the rules and open government meetings. Uh, you know, it's it's been quite a learning process for myself. I've been trying to really learn just how to be, how to better participate in the uh, community democratic process and government of a community. And um, Dave Sykes has always been like really like there and it's just been really nice for myself. And uh, he became a manager, city manager. And um, yeah, he, it's, he's, he's always been a friendly to me and it's been a friendly, uh, I think he's handled the city manager situation with the strong mayor issues really well. Um, I'll miss him. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Cohen. Oh, sorry, no, don't have anything to do. Okay, we'll move forward then. Uh, item uh, three point three is the appeals hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. Forgive me. I should not go to three point three. I should be going at this time directly uh, to. I believe item 10.4 and 10.3. Is that right, Nancy? Nancy's nodding her head. So I'm going to just keep saying it. All right, Nancy won't steer me wrong. Um, so we're going to consider um, the, the uh, rezoning and the urban village plan for the, um, for the Berryessa station area. Uh, let me uh, just make sure I call this properly. This is 10.3, uh, which is general plan amendment site development permit. No, I'm not. It's 
uh, is the city initiate general plan amendment conforming rezoning for Berryessa Bart Urban Village Plan, uh, and then 10.5, which is plan development rezoning for real property located at 1590 Berryessa Road. Now, this is a continuance of a hearing that we were engaged in last week. Um, public comment is closed on this item. Uh, as we discussed last week, we heard extensive public comment last week, certainly in the prior meetings. We uh, have a motion on the floor. We had voted on a motion to continue the meeting. Uh, that was a superseding motion that passed. We're now back to the underlying motion, which was the motion from Council Member Cohen, which was seconded from Council Member Jimenez. Uh, and just to sort of take us and our heroes back to where we left off, uh, Councilman Cohen, if you could begin your comments by telling us what the heck all that motion was <laughs> and what, what you might be doing to it. Yeah, actually, I sent a spreadsheet to uh, to Henry. I don't know if he wants to put that up on the okay, screen. Okay, Henry's going to work on getting that. Okay. He's pulling it up. Now. And so when he, yeah, when he gets it up there, I'll go through it. But I'll just start by saying, as everybody knows, last week, I um, I didn't support the extra time because I, you know, as we heard from colleagues, we were 98% of the way there. And there were so many different moving parts. I was didn't want to risk uh, risk the um, the deal, the, all the all the proposals. Um, but you know, based on direction of the council, we I, I called a meeting on Friday afternoon between the vendors, um, be with the Bum family, their representatives, and with other advocates and members of the council and the mayor. We were all there for that, and uh, it gave us a great space, and it was a nice, productive, uh, cordial conversation between everybody at the table. Um, we heard primarily the the big fear, which is very understandable, from the vendors about their concerns over their security in this in this plan going forward. Um, so there's some things in, in my memo that I wrote yesterday that address that. Um, I first wanna thank uh, the vendors for that productive conversation. I wanna thank the Bum family for um, continuing to leave the proposal, the deal on the table this week and also working with us to try to make sure we address some of those security issues. And so I'm gonna start by re reviewing what the motion was that was on the table and now it's the spreadsheet is shared here. Uh, we had the memo, started with the memo from myself, the mayor and council member Jimenez that moved the planning commission recommendation through the staff memo. It moved the items in the staff supplemental memo and it was amended to, to uh, ensure that a super majority of the flea market advisory group would be representatives of the vendors. <clears throat> and then it included the memo from Council Member Jones, which had four uh, recommendations. It included recommendations one and two from Council Member Carrasco's memo. And it included recommendations 1D, 1E, and four from Council Member Perales's memo. And all the words from those memos are on this uh, spreadsheet that's on the screen. Um, so now, based on the uh, conversation last week and, and additional conversations with the Bum family over the weekend, um, I'm going to amend my motion to add the memo that I uh, published yesterday. Uh, what we've done is two things that offer additional security. Number one is ensure it change is specifying a little bit more strongly the language about not evicting uh, any existing vendors. There was some concern about the way that was written and whether that was clear. Um, so, so that language now says that any vendor who is uh, under a current license agreement at the day that this proposal uh, passes, as long as they follow the rules, will have their license renewed so that there's no question about any attempt to reconstitute the vendor makeup of the flea market in the next three plus years while the market still exists in its current configuration. And then the second item is about the finances. Um, because it's a little bit unclear exactly how usable the ARP money is, um, I wanted to make sure that there was five, for sure, $5 million in the vendor business transition fund. So we spoke with uh, the bums over the weekend to try to get uh, 
them to provide additional money. So now the financial um, offer to seed the transition fund is $5 million. So those, I want to add those to my motion. I also want to add the mayor's memo to my motion, the latest mayor's memo that was published this morning, um, which talks about working with VTA to secure, to find other sites for potentially permanent or temporary uh, locations for vendors. Um, and then also talks about working to figure out whether we can use ARP money or other means of providing resources through the city budget to the, to the transition fund. So I'm adding those two additional memos to this motion, and I guess I'll ask Councilmember Jimenez if he accepts those um, amendments. Yeah, I accept those amendments, and I also just recognize there's, I think I just saw another last minute memo, but uh, but, but I suspect there's it's going to be part of the conversation. But yes, I accept the the the, the amendments as you uh, propose. Okay, well, thank you, and I think that's all I I need, I need to say at this point. Thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Councilmember Perales. Yeah, thank you uh, as well, um, Councilmember Cohen, and uh, as the mayor myself and. Uh, Councilmember Carrasco were there as well. Um, it was good to have that discussion. Thank you, Lauren. I think Lauren's here with us. Um, there you are. Yes, yeah, sorry, looking around my screen. Um, thank you, Lauren. Uh, and then thank you for being here with us today. Um, there were a couple uh, additions that I had within my, my memo that um, I wanted to see if could be um, included as a, a friendly amendment. And then I too am seeing the memo uh, that just came out from Council Member Carrasco and, and uh, I'm trying to pair it up with um, what it was that, that I wanted to ensure was included, which I, I believe uh, they, they coincide, but I'm not 100% certain. So, um, so I may try and and verbalize it at first, and then um, and then see if if we we can kind of get something that matches up. Yeah, because so, across since we're all trying to catch up to the many late memos. If you could just articulate verbally everything you're doing, that'd be helpful. Yeah, no, I, I'm I'm in the same boat, so I'm I, I'm yeah. that that's my plan, uh, anyways. So, and and from my understanding of what's. Uh, included in the current motion, these next items that I'll be discussing, my understanding are not. And so I wanted to ensure um, that they were included. And so from my memo last week, council member Cohen uh, included 1D, 1E, and then three and four. Is that correct, council member Cohen? No, not three, just four is, is in the motion. Okay, so 1D, 1E, and four. I thought you had included number three as well. Number three is already in the legal language. Oh, that, yeah, it was all, already was there. Already there, so we didn't, I didn't include it because it's already in the I included it because you didn't have to. Got it. Okay, so it's, it's there. <laughs> all right. Um, Okay, so just on, on that clarification. And so uh, for me, number one, there's an interest to, obviously I, I you know, drafted that memo, there's an interest um, to wanna have that, the, the full language of my memo included. At this point though, uh, with the exception of number five, cause that is, uh, that was included as well from Vice Mayor Jones memo. And then with the exception of number six, as um, those items, uh, all but one, which I'll ask uh, in a little bit, but they've been addressed uh, by the applicant and then reflected in Councilmember Cohen's uh, latest June 28th memo. Um, and so looking at the other language from, from my original memo, um, I'd like to, to hear from Councilmember Cohen on some of this, uh, these items, and they're, they're pretty spelled out in my memo. If everybody wants to look back at it, uh, there's sort of strike throughs on wording and we put highlighted in red. So that way it makes it very clear. Uh, this was from the, the memo dated June 22nd. For instance, um, 1A, 
uh, we we actually don't have a definitive answer on the number of vendors that are are there, and that's been uh, some some point of contention. And so, in trying to just you know address that particular issue, uh, we suggested some red line language that would take out the approximate 430, and then just put in assist all, and then saying vendors, and then operating on the subject property. So for instance, language like that, um, I'd like to see, you know, I, I can go down each one, because again, you included 1D, for instance, and 1E. So 1B, um, I, I guess I can go down here the list, and I will if, if, if that's the interest of everybody, but it is spelled out pretty clearly in my memo. So I'd like to see if we can include my memo, again, excluding five and six right now, um, as a, a friendly amendment and then understand maybe Councilmember Cohen, why not on some of these issues? And I'm happy to walk through each one if that's if that's of interest. Well, I mean, we can we can ask Vera for, for why language is written the way it was written. We, you know, we didn't specify language, and I and I know that that was a process that occurred between Vera and the and the applicant. And so, you know, what, it, there were reasons for specific for meanings in the in the language that felt you know, I feel are, are important to um, honor since there was a process that occurred with the people and the legal teams of both the city and the applicant. So some of these do change the meaning in a little, a little bit of a way and, that, and I didn't want, you know, I'm not going to accept them until I know, you know that they don't change the meaning. So, you know, we can ask Vera about the language, but I'm, at this point, those, those, those were not accepted because they weren't, uh, you know, clearly agreed to by the applicant because these items that are in the memo were all things that the applicant had agreed to as part of the process. Okay, and some of these things though, we don't need the applicant to agree to, the council can can make the decision. And so I, I have also ran these by Vera, but I'm happy to get uh, Vera your input on the suggested changes, for instance, that I have in 1A, 1B, 1C, um, you know, to see if any of those would bring a legal challenge would be concerning, or if those would be, you know, if we could make those changes without concern. It doesn't look like she's uh, in the meeting. So let me do what I can to get her in the meeting because she's got the background on this. Yeah. Yeah, we might. We uh, might. Here, cut off. Here. Yeah, Henry Caesar, he's going to try to bring her into the, into the room. Welcome, Vera. Hello. Thanks for joining Thanks us, Vera. <laughs> I was attempting to raise my hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I just was found there were two memos, I believe, from Councilmember Perales. So I'm hoping I have the right one. But for the record, I also want to clarify, I have had no communication with the applicant, the council offices have. And so I am responding to language that was drafted by the various council offices. And so um, 1A would be fine. There is no legal issue with 1A. Um, and let me see, what were the others? You wanted all of one, was that true, um, council member Perales? Uh, yeah, I can walk it down because there, uh, there's only a couple. That okay. So one, one B. Okay, would one please do. Okay. Two, you can certainly uh, one B. You can certainly um, adopt. Um, however, the only comment I have is, let's see if we can get half of the vendors association and half of other vendors. It would be if feasible or if possible, you know, to the greatest extent possible. So um, something like that. Okay, so just language that said to the greatest extent possible, something like that. Or, it, or if feasible. If feasible, okay. But that, yeah. that language would be, would be fine. Um, what about yeah. 1C? That would work. C is okay as well. Thank you. And then one D and E are already addressed. Um, 
And I believe, uh, yeah, the two is fine. That's already there. Um, three was already included. Mm -hmm. And then um, four. Oh, and four, I think. I actually, believe. Yeah, four is already included. Councilman Cohen included that four one. Four is so included that's, that's and it. planning planning was okay with that. As yeah, well. yeah, that was it. So it's, those were the, the, those were the, the I think those are the. The leftover contentious one. So thank you, Vera. So with that You're understanding, Councilmember Cohen, would you be would you be comfortable including this? I'm comfortable with one A for sure. That I mean, the only reason I didn't accept it last week was I had gotten the impression that this was language. I mean, so the only thing I'll do is I'll ask Lauren to look at them because he's the representing the Gum family, and I don't want to speak because again, all the language was agreed to because everything here is something that had to be voluntarily given, right? So. They have to do that. Um, Hang on, uh, Councilor Cohen, no. do you want to ask the question? I guess we'll do it one at a time. We can ask about yeah. 1A. Yeah. I don't know if he, I assume he has, Lauren, you have the uh, language in front of you to see it. I do. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, so I am okay with the change you're suggesting in in one A. Okay. So we'll add one A to the motion. I'm okay with that. Same here. Uh, Okay, it's seconders indicating dissent. Okay, 1B is next. Yeah, let me just, let me comment on 1B. We already added the language of the first part of 1B, which was a super majority of free market vendors. So that's in the motion already. Um, I expressed last week why I was, didn't think it was a good idea for the city to specify who and how that makeup within the vendors is, is done. Um, and I think we've heard some opinions, you know, from others about why that was potentially problematic to be more prescriptive than that. Um, you know, I, I, I prefer to leave that to the vendors. I mean, it may end up being this way. I, I just don't, I, 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 to me, I'm not interested in, in that, being that prescriptive in this, in this uh, item. 1C, I was a little bit concerned about too. I wanted to comment about that. 1C. Before we jump on oh, 1C, can we ask Lauren for his? Yeah, we can ask Lauren about one B. I don't. I think we heard from them Friday that they didn't really care about the making of the committee, but I guess we were asking Lauren to. So, yeah. So, uh, I understand that I I'm not comfortable making changes on the fly to 1B or 1C for that matter today because this has been a memo that has been vetted internally here um, by by many, many people. Uh, and I don't have the necessary authority today to do that. I also believe that this is an issue that we feel can be more appropriately addressed by the flea market advisory group as contemplated by this whole thing. Um, and once that's established that uh, further dialogue could happen in that forum uh, with respect to this. Uh, but at this point, I'm not comfortable um, recommending any deviation to this at this point. And before we move on to 1C, Lauren, I think the, the one contradicting statement there is that the flea market advisory group is, is what is exactly what we're talking about. We can't ask the flea market advisory group to help us decide who is on the flea market advisory group. We have to sort of help set up, you know, what that looks like. And so Councilmember Cohen's statement, it was it was uh, my understanding from the meeting on Friday um, that you were president and Eric Shanehauer that um, you were indifferent on, you know, if various flea market vendors association participants could participate in that advisory group. And the interest here is, uh, number one, just to make sure there's vendors, which I appreciate Councilmember Cohen has included as the super majority. I think that's the most important thing. And so I'm glad that that's there. The other thing, though, is that we do have 
you know, a vendor's association, um, albeit, right, it may not represent every single vendor that's there right now. And, and I recognize that, which is why um, I felt that it at least should, should have fairness in knowing that that vendor's association has some seats on this advisory group. The indication that we got on Friday is that you were comfortable with that. Um, the indication now, it sounds like you're saying you, you're not comfortable with that. What I'm comfortable with is the language, I guess, that's in the letter to Chris Burton uh, that, that we've provided, and that has in paragraph H what the flea market advisory group, um, who it would consist of, and what it would do. Okay, I'm, I'm going to just interrupt for just a moment. Um, there are no other hands up, so I'm going to continue to allow this to go, but if another council member wants to speak, I, I need to respect the time limits here. Yeah, so I'm, happy go ahead, to, I'm happy to raise my hand again if somebody yeah. throws their hand up. I'm not monitoring the hands, so sorry. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. looking at all the documents. No, that's fine. No, continue. I just want to make sure. I'm so um, can you, I'm sorry, I, I don't have that lettered up as well. I could pull it up, but can you remind me, um, did you did you indicate participation from the various flea market vendors association specifically as well? So the paragraph H of the letter that we submitted, which is our voluntary agreement to conditions for this PDC 17051, provides that a flea market advisory group consisting of representatives of the property owner, flea market vendors, and the city will be created in accordance with item I, with the intention of ensuring flea market vendors have a meaningful voice and role in determining the use of transition funds and guiding the development of the urban market concept. And then it goes on to specify additional protocol. Um, oh, okay, thank you. So it doesn't specifically specify seats, if you will, or representation from the, the various flea market vendors association. It, it was to all flea market vendors. Yeah. Is there a reason why you're reluctant to specifically name the various flea market vendors association when, when again, I, I think the indication from you was you were indifferent on Friday on them being participants. I think we all recognize that the association is, you know, the reason why we're, we're here is finally there are some organization there with the vendors and you have not to say they're a unanimous voice, um, you know, but, but they certainly uh, are a collective voice for vendors there. And um, at least if we could identify, you know, some participation for them in this advisory group where where I feel I would be, it would be unacceptable for me and it should be unacceptable, quite frankly, for, for you as well, is that if we create a flea market advisory group and somehow zero of the, the current, you know, representation from the flea market vendors association is a participant of that. Um, you know, we're gonna have more fireworks than, than we had over the last couple of weeks. And so, that was again the indication that I got from from you on Friday that you were you were indifferent about that. So I, I guess I'm just concerned on the hesitancy now. There's no hesitancy, and I and I apologize if you're sensing some uh, some retraction of that. The fact is is that we're open for for any and all vendors to participate in the process. Uh, we're agnostic as to which of the members uh, the vendors are members of this organization. Uh, we hope they would all participate uh, in this process. Uh, but the fact is, is that um, we want to make it open to everyone, number one. And number two, um, I guess part of, part of my concern with identifying any organization is that we've not been provided any information that, the, that any association has been formally created, right, uh, to, to do this. And so um, until and unless there's, there's some, some showing on that part, at this point, any of the vendors who want to participate should should be should be um, allowed to, uh, and uh, uh, we you know would open it to everyone, um, and, and we would we would hope that the uh, flea market advisory group that gets created in this process through today's vote um, would be empowered with the tools to put that group together. Okay, thank you, and and I I don't think there is a formal process, correct, to have a. The flea market, do you have a formal process for an association to become developed and be recognized formally? The state of California must have some requirements for an association. Uh, I, I, you know, and again, I don't know to what extent the BFVA has participated or pursued that. Um, and so 
I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to have that as part of this for very formal process uh, if we don't know the extent that they've been even um, recognized by the state. I don't, I don't think all formal associations like this have to be recognized by the state. I'm not a lawyer, but they, they are your vendors, um, right? And so to formally decide if somebody's recognized as an association, I imagine the, you know, the flea market, Inc. can have a, a process for that. That's what I was saying. I don't think you have one, correct? Us internally? Yeah, internally. Uh, yeah, no. no. Okay. Jennifer so Perales, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to clarify something on this issue. Councilmember Cohen, haven't you already accepted the notion that some of the members should be part of the the uh, the BFBA? He is not here. That's why I mean, it's not it's not it's not it's not enumerated in the motion. I'm not. It's not that I'm saying that they shouldn't be. I think they should be. I, I but that that's a personal question as opposed to as opposed to what should be written in the language. I, Okay. My feeling is that we shouldn't specify any specific group in here, but that, you know, at the end of the day, I, I don't have any doubt that that group will be heavily represented because they are the most active vendors of the food market. Um, so, I mean, I'll just say the only, this conversation we, we had with, with Nancy, for example, in, in uh, OD, maybe Nancy, you want to get a little bit of a background on what, how where we landed this way? Thank you very much, um, Nancy Klein, Office of Economic Development. OED looks forward to working with BFVA and the other vendors uh, to ensure uh, the majority or supermajority of vendors are uh, giving active voice on the future decisions, not only for the funds, but also future design. Um, I just asked the attorneys, I believe the uh, more formal process would come is if uh, the association became 501c3, which would allow them to accept uh, dollars. Um, and while we may absolutely get there, we're just not there quite yet. That that seems a little bit beyond what, you know, I think having a seat at the, the advisory group, I don't think we're talking yet about should we be giving them dollars. So I would agree with you there, right? Clearly there's some issues, but it doesn't sound like, uh, at least in my mind, I don't understand why they're, there would be an issue with it. And Mayor, did that clarify your 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 question? Because I, I, I did. I'm sorry. I thought I was going to be able to resolve this, but obviously I wasn't. So my apologies. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, I, I think um, you know it, it sounds like this is not going to be accepted. I wanted to get the understanding from Lauren as to to why, because I did get a, a different um, understanding from both Eric Shanehauer two weeks ago. Um, where he said he was, you know, completely comfortable uh, if various flea market vendors association members uh, participated on the um, on the advisory group, and then that seemed to be the indication where uh, on Friday you denoted you you guys were indifferent about that. But it it, it sounds like you don't want to go one step further, which would be actually ensuring it. And I know Councilmember Cohen feels maybe comfortable that or confident that you know, members of the Vendors Association will ultimately be part of the advisory group. I am not. And I know the Vendors Association board is not either, right? They, they, this would give them that assurance. It wouldn't even give them, you know, the majority of the votes. It would just ensure that they have some participation. Um, and uh, I, I'd, I'd even be willing to, you know, sort of negotiate away uh, the half of whom, or at least half of whom, right? Something like that, where, where, where it's at least you, you know that you have participation um from the vendors association on the advisory group but it sounds like we won't get there and just to confirm with with nora or vera this is something that this language specifically this would have to be agreed upon by lauren today or at least a representative of the bum family is that correct vera i'll let you answer that that's my understanding but i'll let you answer that well because they're donating money to this um committee um, that, you know, we should have some agreement as to who will be on the committee. But if I might make a suggestion also, I think one of the concerns, at least, that I heard from staff on this, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nancy or others, is that um, naming an association may be problematic if that association seeks to exist in the future, and that you've, are, you've named them in your composition. And one of the things that perhaps, I don't know if it would 
be acceptable to everyone, but you could say that the committee will include any association of vendors and vendors. You know, it could be anybody, not necessarily the named association, but any association of vendors that may currently or exist now exist or in the future. And I don't know if that would be acceptable to the applicant. I would be I would be comfortable with that as a as as compromise language. I agree with you as to why, you know, maybe the naming this exact association would be an issue. Um, currently, it's the only, you know formal association, maybe whether it's recognized or not, it, it's the only formal association of, of vendors there at the flea market. It may not be the only one in the future, I would agree with you, and 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 maybe names change or whatnot. And so um, I would be comfortable with that shift in the language, um, but I, I too would be comfortable. I'll that. accept I'll accept that as a as a language. It says any official association or any, I don't know how to what however you think is the right word in here, any named association will will be represented on the in the group. Yeah, I think we could say, and I don't know if my speaker is still on. Yes, it is. It is. Okay, good. I think we could just say any association of vendors um, and any vendor. Okay. That's, I'll accept that. Okay. And let's see if that's okay with the applicant. That's acceptable. And I just wouldn't want to get hung up in the future, Lauren, that like, you know, there's some arduous process on, hey, we haven't officially deemed you as an association or you need to get some sort of, uh, you know, recognition by the state. Because I don't, I don't think the bar needs to be that high, right? I think the bar should be with you, <laughs> right? That says, hey, yeah, you know, we're going to agree that, that um, you know, this is a, a, an association of our own vendors. So uh, that's the only thing I would be concerned about, just make sure that, that you're not setting some sort of bar uh, or that's your intent. I know you, you mentioned it about uh, recognition of the state. I, I don't think that needs to be the bar and I'm, I'm hoping you would agree to that. And, and just to be clear that this is this, this group, this vendor associate um, advisory group well, be run by the by the uh, applicant, right? It would be something the city is running. And so it, it wouldn't be something that would be left up to the, the um, family or anybody else to make that determination. It would be a city process. That's, that's even better. I mean, then Lauren, you don't even have to answer. If, if we can get clarification from Vera, would that be on us to sort of be able to, to have a process that would deem if an association is, is a you know, formal associate, a recognized association? You can, and they can be, they can be informal, just a group, you know, group, we have neighborhood groups, they can be people with different interests at the flea market, for example, um, and, and that it could be up to the council and obviously the applicant is agreeing to that. I am, um, recommendation, uh, year 1B, the, the change that we would make and let me read it into the record if it's acceptable um, to the council would be a flea market advisory group, and this would be recommendation 2H, the change to it. Um, a flea market advisory group consisting of a supermajority of flea market vendors, half of whom are, are uh, consist of vendors of vendors associations, as well and and half of excuse me I'm messing this up sorry a flea market advisory group consisting of a supermajority of flea market vendors, half of whom are members of vendors associations, as well as representatives of the property owner slash developer and the city will be created. That, that's good with me. I have Possible. a clarification. Wait, 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 wait. I, I just wanna be clear with the maker of the motion. It's, that's the motion. I wasn't necessarily saying the half part. I mean, I think we got to that point of just saying that any, I, I don't know how to put it in and have it read as one sentence. Maybe it doesn't have to stay as one sentence, but any, in my, I think with the, the intent of what I was accepting was any group that is a flea market, any official group of flea market vendors, I don't know how, um, would, would have a seat, right? Or so, something like that. I don't know how it would, would be, would, be a mem would have membership on the, on the group. Because I don't know how, I mean, to me, there were some issues we had, we talked about this before, how do you, you know, if you have to guarantee it as half of one or half, I mean, you don't necessarily always know you're going to have a, a, the right active membership and makeup, but if every group is guaranteed having a voice on the group, on the, on the group that, that wants it, 
then to me, that's, I think, the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish here. Okay, so the language would be amended to delete the portion I, to have. clarification on the language, please, because I'm I'm tracking it down. So, because okay. because I'm confused between what Vera had suggested. She said, um, consisting of vendors association as well as vendors. I think but that's we just a, changed it to we just changed it to a vendor seat. Can somebody please clarify? <laughs> Thank you. Because I thought we were shooting for a super majority of vendors. Right, and that's still in there. Yeah. And there's okay, so that's still in the motion. The majority of vendors, okay, good. which so will include at least one representative from any existing vendor organization. Okay, got it. Thank you. So can I describe uh, the the difference then? I guess from what what I what Vera read or what she stated, and then what uh, which which I would be comfortable with, and then what Councilmember Cohen is is uh, willing to accept. So uh, I liked what Vera said because what that that ensures is that number one, yes, a supermajority of the new advisory group would be consist would consist of vendors, but half of those vendors. <laughs> in my mind, should be part of a association, whether there's the one association or there's multiple associate, whatever, you know, how the city wants to, to recognize and say, yep, these are associations within the various flea market vendors that I feel that there gives credence to that as to why, right, their association and why they should be half of that super majority of vendors, meaning the other half would be just independent vendors potentially. What I believe Councilman Cohen is saying, and tell me if I'm wrong, Councilman Cohen, is that you're only comfortable with indicating as much as one seat, uh, assuring one seat for whichever associations you know we deem are 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 valid. Is that correct? That's kind of a sort of your interpretation of what I said. I mean, it's not quite what I said. I'm happy with any makeup of this group that could be more than half, but I'm don't want to be prescriptive with the word half. I want to make sure that any group that constitutes itself has a seat and that the supermajority will be vendors. And my belief is that at the end of the day, most of those vendors will end up being from those groups because that's the ones who will organize and get involved on, in this, in what gets set up. So I'm, I, I'm not accepting the word half. I think that's over prescriptive, but I'm, I want language. I'm perfectly, you know, I think it's good to have language that says any group that is organized to represent vendors should be part of this. Okay, I'm gonna jump in right now because I want to make sure we've got some clarity. We've had a lot of back and forth on language, and I know Tony's probably pulling her hair out trying to nail this thing down. Um, but you've clearly heard what David has articulated, hopefully, as the motion, Tony. Um, is it possible we can, at some point, put language up on the screen so everybody can be very clear about what the motion is and what it's not? I will try Thank to work you. on that. Thank okay. you. So Tony's going to work on that. Thank you, Tony, for undertaking it because we know this has been about as messy <laughs> a motion-making process uh, just by virtue of the complexity of the issue. Not that that's anybody's fault. It's just, it's complex. Okay. Um, Vera, you've had your hand up. I want to make sure. Oh. Okay, great. Well, uh, I should have probably put it down, but I, I may also have some language if you want me to help Tony out. So I can yeah, write it Yeah, that'd be fine if you and Tony could Let me send it to her. back and forth. That'd yeah, be great. thank you. All right, Councilman Perales, you still have the floor. Thank you. Uh, and, and so just to be clear, I, I think my understanding is correct as what Councilman Cohen just reiterated, that there is a, a scenario where a vendor's association may only end up with one seat on the advisory group. There is also a scenario where they end up with more than half, I, I agree, but um, it, it sort of leaves up the, the spectrum for our, at, a, at a bare minimum, and that's what we're talking about here is guarantees. At a bare minimum, they're only guaranteed one spot, and that's what I was trying to clarify, and, and that to me is not sufficient. Um, I think that, and, and quite frankly, we need to be very prescriptive in these things because, you know, hopes and aspirations are not going to get us to where we want to go. It's, it's going to be the definitive nature of the language that, you know, seven years from now, people are falling back to because everything's been delayed and nobody, you know, uh, on this council is still here and people are going to go back and look at the language. Um, and I hope it doesn't take that long. But the point is, is that this is what we're, this is what we have to rest on is, you know, what, what is definitively in there. And just because, uh, you know, somebody may hope 
or, or have a feeling as though more of these vendors from associations will make up the advisory group, there's no assurance of that. And that's one of the, the asks, I think, that, that the Vendors Association have made very clear, and it's one, obviously, that, that for me is very meaningful, is that they have uh, representation. I appreciate that we've already, just in this sausage making, we've gotten a little bit further than we were when we started uh, this conversation at 1.30, because now we at least know uh, that there'll be you know, a seat at minimum for a representative from uh, an official association. So I, I appreciate that, and I, I like the direction we're going. Um, I still don't think it's far enough, and I and I uh, I'm I'm willing to you know to to bend on language like half, and, and not necessarily have it say half, but I'm I'm not comfortable if it only says um, we'll have a seat because that 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 that's only one, and so I don't you know the only other way we can actually prescribe things more loosely is using percentages, you know, without saying two or three. We don't know how many people are going to be on this group. That's why I used uh, half. Um, you know, I I, I can't necessarily. Um, you know, think of what I might be comfortable with. Maybe we say a third of whom, uh, you know, maybe is, is, is more acceptable to you, Councilmember Cohen. But I, I think um, that's the, that's where the nature of that, that confusion is. I'll, I'll let this rest because it sounds like um, we may have gone as far as, as we can go at the moment on this unless somebody else wants to chime in um, and then go down to recommendation. Can I chime in and offer some possible middle ground, which is the word multiple. <laughs> it's more than one. Better, it's better than one. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not against progress. <laughs> uh, Councilor Cohen. I guess I'm not sure what that means because I mean, if you have end up with five groups and you want multiple representatives of every group, I don't know how you do that. So yeah, it would, I mean, it my point is, of every group. It my point is that the city staff is going to, is, is going to be in charge of creating this. We guarantee a super majority. We guarantee that every official organization has a seat. And I think that that's as prescriptive as I want to get. So, I, I mean, I, we can keep hashing this out, but I am not going to accept more being more prescriptive as a friendly amendment. Uh, that's okay. the, the end of that. Okay, back to you, Councilor Cross. Thank you. All right, I'll make a substitute motion then that includes, uh, uh, let me, hear, I'll, I'll make it simple here then. Um, uh, Councilor Cross, let me actually butt in on this one. I think a substitute motion would be out of order. Uh, we've heard a substitute motion that we voted on. We're now on the base motion. Uh, uh, Nora, did you want to weigh in? I think the substitute motion was 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 only a motion to continue, though. It wasn't actual motion on the item. Is that correct? No, but Nora. under under rules of order, there's one substitute motion, and and that was a substitute motion, and then you have to go to the underlying motion. All right, then I won't make a substitute motion. Yeah, as a parliamentarian, I'll offer you one. Look, I'm going to offer a fig leaf here as a parliamentarian myself. <laughs> that would have to be an amendment that's not friendly that you could then bring to a vote if you want to do that on that one item. But I. I mean, you know, whether, whether that's worth, you know, the, the difference here. I mean, let, let, we want to finish the rest of your questions about any other items, and then, you know, we can decide what, you can decide if you want to do that. But I'm, I'm not accepting that one as a friend of mine, and, and I think we're... Yeah, I'll go back to, uh, to to path A, which is asking for friendly amendments then. Uh, and that one, I think, will we'll rest at, at where it's at at the moment. Um, you did not accept the multiple language that the mayor suggested, correct? Just wasn't correct. telling me how that could work, and so I didn't know. Correct. Okay. Okay. So I think we're down to one C then now. Um, yes. Uh, Councilmember Perales, I, I've read this three or four times now. There's, you probably realize there's some grammatical challenges with it, um, as it's stated in the memorandum. Do you want to edit this somehow? Yeah, we can edit it on the fly. I'll, I'll tell you what the, 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 the main gist of it here is currently, um, and, and I'll look at the motion that we have on the table, uh, which is, excuse me, going to it, 3B from Councilman Cohen's memo. Um, Oh, I'm looking at the wrong Councilor Cohen memo. There we go. So the the motion has uh, item three B, which says prior to submittal of an application for the PD permit referenced in three A, 
the property owner shall make and complete a reasonable evaluation of the financial feasibility of a denser multi-level urban market. Um, am I on the right one here? I'm sorry, which 3B? Can you state where that came from? I'm trying to follow. Yeah, I'm in uh, Councilmember Cohen, Councilmember Jimenez, and, Council and the mayor's memo from last week. Got it. Thank you. And then my memo is referencing uh, their recommendation, excuse me, their recommendation 3A, I apologize, not 3B, um, 3A which states, uh, add the following conditions of approval to the ordinance rezoning the subject property. Include a provision that any future plan development permit that specifically authorizes the detailed architectural design of a future urban market and the actual vendor stalls shall be considered for approval by the, the city council. So I, I do appreciate that. I, I, that's been an interest of mine that we, we come back to the council for a future uh, PD permit, plan development permit this though, it doesn't just doesn't go as far as I was hoping. Uh, this talks about that the a future PD permit, and then as it says, specifically authorizes the detailed architectural design of a future urban market um, and the actual vendor stalls. So it's very specific in what PD permit would come back to the council. Um, and it's specifically around the, the new urban market. There could be other PD permits that come forward to the council that uh, could displace portions of the existing flea market. For instance, say there's a portion of the existing flea market where we're going to have future housing built, and that PD permit may not necessarily trigger the language that is in the current motion. And that's what I'm trying to get to with my language, and I apologize if it's, if it's uh, confusing as it was worded. So the idea would be that rather than just come back to the council on a PD permit for the future urban market, that I'd like the trigger to be any future PD permit that is displacing current vendors. That's so that's the that's the ask for the friendly amendment. Can you repeat that? I'm sorry, oh. can you say that again? Let me let me um see. Let me see if Councilor Cohen can respond, and then I'll. I feel about this, and I think Lauren can weigh in on this too. What concerns me is that is this this the generality of that term potential displacement, future displacement. What's been happening as as this market evolves is that sometimes um, people are relocated as development occurs in different parts of the market, and I suspect that that's a possibility in the future as something comes forward where development might say, we're gonna take this corner and develop something, but we might be able to open space over here for a while to move vendors over here. And, and so if we begin to get into this thing that every time those kind of moves happen, we're talking about having to bring a PD permit to the council. I don't think that that's the spirit of what we're, we're talking about in this, um, in this idea. And I think, I mean, I guess Lauren can give the perspective of the, of the market, but my feeling is that there was a reason why this was the agreed to language because the market won't necessarily look like it does today. That doesn't mean that the, all the vendors are not accommodated. And I want to be very careful about what we specify in this language. Yeah, I would, um, I would concur with Council Member Cohen's comments. Uh, our, our business model and our market is a very fluid thing. Uh, and over, over the last five years, it's compressed and changed and morphed several times um, as we've added parking here that was previously across the street that's been developed. Uh, and so um, I think we've felt internally that uh, that the language um, that uh, council member Perales is suggesting is a little too um, constrictive for our for our general business purposes and our, and our needs. It, it, it really creates a, a tightrope for us to have to come back to city council anytime there's a potential displacement of vendors. Uh, even though they're simply being moved to another part of the part of the uh, flea market site. <clears throat> so, 
so there's two other, uh, you know, I guess avenues for this, and they were both suggested in Councilmember Carrasco's memos. Um, she had one from last week in her recommendation number five uh, at the end of it that talked about um, direct administration when the applicant has a viable project for the flea market redevelopment, return to council for approval of proposed use and obtain plan development permit or plan development amendment, uh, whichever is applicable at the time and direct staff to work with developer to develop a plan for community. That, that, that portion of it there is, is already included, but that's one indication of it. There's another on the memo that she submitted today and it's in uh, recommendation one. Um, and, and she has some suggested language there, which I'll read it as well. And it's, uh, if the property owner were to apply for any plan development permit prior to applying for the PD permit referenced in 3A in the original, Cohen Licardo Jimenez memo that, that I was reading earlier, uh, the property owner must identify a future developer of the urban market or grant the various flea market vendors association or, or its chosen, chosen entity or successor, a right of uh, first offer and a right of first refusal to lease or pr purchase the land to develop and operate the urban market. So it goes a little bit further in that one. Um, I'm curious on your your take on on that. That's that's not necessarily as far as I was trying to push, but that that's another, I think, indication on the same path. What would be your response to to her recommendation one? Is that is that to me or to Councilmember Cohen? It was to you first, but I'm I'm happy to hear from Councilmember Cohen first uh, as well. That I mean that's. I, I wouldn't accept that. I mean, that's that's a major legal question. I think there's some legal issues. We've vetted a lot of things through legal counsel throughout this process, and this one hasn't been vetted. So, I mean, I I wouldn't accept it. You know, that, that as a as a friendly amendment here. Either. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Again, again, I would I, I would concur. Uh, that okay. proposes a, a, a whole different vetting process internally that, that today I'm not prepared to address. <clears throat> okay, and then just a question for, for Vera then. Um, the, the indication I was trying to get you back to, to my memo um, where we're asking for any future plan development permit that may uh, potentially displace uh, any portion of, let's say, you know, vendors uh, rather than the existing flea market, um, uh, any operating vendors, could we specify that that would have to, to return to council uh, versus the language that, that we currently have on the table? Is that something that we could specify today and we don't necessarily need agreement from, uh, from Lauren here? The the council may specify which permits, um, which discretionary permits can come back to it and under what circumstances. Okay, so that's something we could we could put in as a requirement. Great. Yes, and I did not hear everything that you said because I was paying attention to um, to um, another matter involving this. Um, no, wait, if it was, you could you repeat already... that. You had already read over my recommendation 1C and stated that it was legally fine. I think the mayor pointed out as well that it's the language could be a little confusing. And so it's not necessarily displacing a portion of the existing flea market. I was actually talking about mm -hmm. the, the operational portion of the flea market. So not like parking lots and stuff like that. So that's what I was trying to specify. Okay. But it does okay. sound like we have the opportunity um, to come back and essentially to make it simple, could just say any any future plan development permit is going to come back to the council uh, would make it that much more cleaner rather than trying to to find a middle ground, um, which is which I'm comfortable with as well. But it sounds like, and, and that would be for any per, that would be for any permit on the in the flea market district. Yes. Okay. Yeah, but that's fine. That's it's not a it's not a accepted. Uh, so that that's not being uh, included. I think that uh, exhausts mayor, uh, I'm gonna look at Councilmember Carrasco's uh, memo, but I think that exhausts my asks and it sounds like those two um, 
are not going to be accepted. And since I can't make a substitute motion, uh, then I'll just have to consider my vote. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Council Member Cross. Not only did you exhaust all those, you also exhausted the clock. You're the first uh, council member to exceed the 42 minute limit. So oh. uh, congratulations. All right. Uh, Nancy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make sure council recalled that in, in Vice Mayor Jones's prior memo, which was approved by council, there is a requirement that when the first market rate housing comes in, that there is um, a need for a requirement for the uh, site development permit for the urban market to come forward at the same time. And the intention, I believe, Vice Mayor, behind that was to ensure that the, the market would be begun early on in the process, but not to impose or hurt anything related to affordable housing. Um, and the other piece, and it's really just for information, not trying to debate here, um, if every permit comes back to council, it, it could well be that it will make it harder to get other developers to take on the project. Thank you. Okay, uh, are there any other, oh, Council Member Crosco. Mayor, um, and, and first of all, I, I wanna thank, <laughs> I wanna thank everyone uh, uh, involved and I wanna thank everybody for coming back today, uh, Mayor. Uh, this uh, has been obviously a, a very long process and, uh, but I think it's uh, it's been worthwhile and I wanna thank Lauren for being here uh, and representing the Bum family, and of course for uh, for being part of that very um, <clears throat> what I thought was a very productive conversation on Friday, and I know that the vendors and the association are with us uh, as we're having this conversation, and they're probably biting their nails because I know that they can't have a a, a convo uh, or or can weigh in, but that was our agreement on uh, uh, last week when we decided to have a continuation. So thanks, thank you everybody for, for being very patient. So just to be clear, council member Cohen, if you could just, so that we don't uh, bite into all of my time, quickly tell me what you've accepted from council member Perales, cause he took a lot of time. <laughs> I before we go through that, could we ask Tony if she has it in writing yet? Oh, that okay, yeah. Good yeah, for I all just want to know from his, uh, from his uh, memo and from all the uh, friendly amendments that he tried to slip in. I just want to know what was accepted. Okay. <laughs> so, so, I guess uh, that, I want to just say he persuaded me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Please, so, does Tony, Tony Tabor City Clerk let me know if I missed something? Thank you. Okay, so Councilmember Cohen, I'll let you take a close look here at what's posted and make sure it accords with what you believe you've accepted. Yeah, so I accepted from the amendment to add 1A from Councilmember Perales' memo. Um, I also, we also, through the process of, I guess somebody's not muted. Um, the process of discussion led us to a compromise on 1B that didn't go exactly what he had recommended, but it included you know, so a, a mix of vendors from, from any vendor association that um, exists at the time or that exists and wants to have a seat at the table. So just one moment. Can I ask everyone else to mute except for council member Cohen? So we've got a lot of feedback. Yeah, I was having trouble. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, so 1A and then a, a, a version of 1B that's not exactly what was asked for, but is, but is, um, Members from any vendors, yeah, that, that what's written there. So we market advisory group with a student majority and including members from any vendor association. So that was the that were the changes that were accepted. Add in the word association as it's not. Yeah, yeah, read it, it's associations. Not. So at the end, where the apostrophe is after vendors, it should actually just say from any vendors associations. And I would concur, yes.
Okay. Um, Councilmember Crosco. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I was under the impression that uh, more of his memo had been accepted. Uh, Councilman Perales. It had been to... previously. Uh, he could go through all of those items. This is just what he accepted in today's discussion. Pretty much. So just to be clear, 1D and 1E are already in the motion. 1D and 1E? Yeah, they're already in the motion. They were in before, okay. last week. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Okay. So it's, it's A, D, and E, a, ver a different version of B. Um, Two is already in the motion. Three is already in the motion. Four is already in the motion. Five and six are not. But everything else is in the motion already. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, and have you had an opportunity to look at the latest uh, memo that I submitted uh, this morning? I it, it just I just got it five minutes before the meeting started. So I, I mean I looked through it, but I you know we haven't had a lot of time to okay get into so the details. This, this is a recap also of the conversation that we had, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, uh, Mr. Lauren will, uh, uh, since I know that he's very good at dissecting uh, very complex documents uh, uh, because of his uh, acumen, if, uh, if you could just glance over that. Uh, it, it's, uh, it summarizes a lot of the dialogue that we had on Friday uh, with the vendors uh, and with the council members and the mayor on Friday uh, uh, and um, with a few little tweaks. Uh, we'll get to uh, one in just a second. Uh, it just has a few little additions uh, or changes. Um, I'm changing uh, to one E and it makes some references uh, and it changes, it strikes some of the language and it includes uh, 1E to De Anza Flea Market, Laney College Flea Market, and it strikes the rest of that language. I don't know if that's acceptable to you, uh, Council Member Cohen and Lauren. Uh, 2A uh, goes from six months to 12 months, and it really is, again, just to add that, that sense of stability. Uh, we talked about it at, at length, um, really more than anything. It, again, it's to allow the vendors and their families to uh, feel secure. I don't know how much more to add to that. You heard it better than, than I could possibly express it from them. Uh, and so it's, it's, uh, it's really uh, cementing that for them. Uh, and, and of course, uh, four was, uh, was including uh, Council Member Perales, but, uh, but you already included all that. And so in, in terms of those uh, few items that we just discussed, um, Council Member Cohen, would that be acceptable to you before I go on? I'm sorry, you asked about your item 1E and 2A. Is that what it was? Yes. Um, 2A, well, I'll just say this. I mean, we can let Nora answer this question. I think we, we know that 2A wouldn't be legal for us to be able to impose. So I mean, Nora can well, answer that for question. Us. Not for us, but uh, I guess it's more of a question for Mr. Lauren. Right, and number for 1E, I actually don't have a, a, a preference about the language on 1E, but we'll ask Nancy if there's any issue with this language and changing it from what was there to this new one doesn't, I don't have a strong feeling. Nancy? Nor do I. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, we can ask Lauren too what he thinks of 1E. 1E, I'm agnostic about it. If you think that's better language, I'm fine with it. But we'll ask Lauren what he thinks about 1E. Uh, just to be clear, Lauren, do you have the, the new memo from Council Member Brasco? You probably don't have it. So I, that's actually kind of a problem, right? So we can't even ask him to give it to weigh in. Um, somebody would have to send him what we're talking about or post it on the, and share it on the screen. It's one sentence. Maybe somebody could read it. So the, the maybe be helpful to post it on the screen. I think <laughs> ask somebody Agreed. their opinion Agreed. on the spot. This is of the Carrasco memo. This doesn't appear to be the same memo. Yeah, no. it's, sorry, it's, I opened the wrong one.
is it this this is the most recent from Councilmember Carrasco? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, Councilman Cohen, you want to direct Lauren to the right uh, paragraph? So it's the amendment, proposed amendment for 1E that's right in the middle of the screen here, just changing it to say any other similar markets, to change it to say, to name those specific markets. Um, but it still says such as ahead of it, so. Right, and so, so to understand the intent of this, is this the intent to sort of define what's meant by an open air market? Uh, as that would be sort of the threshold for determining what the rents would be, or are we defining these three markets as the markets by which rent will be set? Well, it, it, it's to define, uh, yes, it's to define the open air markets. Okay, and so that could be any open air market in the Bay Area, including but not limited to the Capital Flea Market, De Anza Flea Market, and the Laney College Flea Market. Is that correct? Right. So if we want to include in their language that has, that includes, but not limited to those three, I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay. So Councilmember Cohen, is that the language you'd be prepared to accept including, but not limited to? Sure. Yes. Okay. I'll... All right. Is that okay with the seconder? Yes. All right. Councilmember Carrasco. Thank you. And uh, and then uh, and I don't know if you saw two uh, a uh, and it would um, obviously we can't impose um, uh, but it would uh, I think you're looking for Mr. Vacaresis, uh whether they're voluntarily willing to accept that is that right Yeah okay. And so, so to be clear, this is regarding the license agreements, correct? Yes. Yeah. So let me just let me just state that uh, we we thought about this internally, and 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 this was a big takeaway from last Friday's discussion, and uh, we internalized it uh, and understand that our market and our vendors uh, it, it creates quite of a complex situation here because not um, all of the vendors want six month licenses or one year licenses. Some wanna only be out here in the springtime, some only in the fall, some only wanna be out here uh, month to month or day sellers. Uh, and so it creates another layer of, of, of bureaucracy, another layer of work that internally we've got to absorb. And uh, we just thought that the easiest way to do that is to uh, adopt these six month blocks uh, that would continue unless of course they're, um, you know, unless of course there was some uh, violation of the rules that would provide otherwise. But, um, but the other part of the rationale was that we also felt very comfortably that our current assurances to the council by this, by the memo that's before the council is that the earliest any notice that we would provide would be submitted would be 2023. So on top of, um, at least another two to three years for the vendors, they're also getting these six month licenses. Uh, and so uh, that that sort of is, is our position today, just based upon, you know, the, the working knowledge I have of, of our of our company and, and what works best for us internally and why we felt that that still provided ample and double protection for the vendors. Um, okay, Councilmember Carrasco, yeah. we do have a hand up. Yeah. So I'm gonna come back to you. Oh, okay. All right. And uh, I, I, I have a, a few more items to uh, go. Okay. Through. Yes, I'd like we'll to pick those up shortly. Thank you so much. Councilor Sparson. I'll be quick. Um, so I had a, a question on uh, the 12 month license agreement. Since we're there, that was one of my questions. Um, but, uh, on the memo from Councilmember Carrasco on item two, uh, 2A. So I'm, I'm going to assume that that's to offer um, rent protections to vendors. Um, and this is a question for Councilmember Cohen or Lauren. Um, can you, so Lauren, you just described some assurances in terms of displacement and notice. Can you talk about the pricing and the commitment um, that uh, might be made to the vendors 
so that there wasn't, for example, price gouging or some, you know, that rents didn't double or something like that, or, or license, I'm sorry, license agreements didn't double. Um, can you talk about that? Well, I can tell you that we've been in business for 61 years and we've never engaged in that kind of practice that doesn't do us any good, that doesn't do our vendors any good, and that doesn't do the customers any good. So uh, that, that type of uh, conduct is not something that, that we subscribe to here, nor would we going forward. Um, having said that, um, if the underlying question is, is, is there uh, a, a, an ability to, to um, uh, lock into place rates so that they wouldn't increase, I would say, number one, again, I'm, I'm not authorized to do that today. Number two, uh, what has been approved is what's before you. And number three, that that is a big ask um, for um, a city to make to a private business coming out of a COVID lockdown where last year we lost millions of dollars um, because we weren't able to operate. Uh, and so I don't think we have any um, movement on our part to to all of a sudden gouge our vendors or, our, or the public, uh, but we also have um, a duty to the public, to the business, uh, to our employees, uh, to, uh, to, to run a, a business that, that's, uh, that can sustain itself and is profitable. You know, we weren't fortunate enough to benefit from PPP funding, uh, and we extended many breaks to our vendors last year without rent when we were closed and even when we reopened. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think we're sympathetic to all their needs, and, and I think we've listened and we've heard, and we continue to have that dialogue, and I think we will in the future. Um, we're just not signing up for some, some prescription against our ability to run our business the way that we think we know best. Yeah, I get that. I don't think you're going to uh, make back millions of dollars. Um on the backs of, of vendors in, in six month increments. Um, I, I think, um, you know, also it's helpful to remind folks that, you know, lease their, I'm sorry, I keep saying leases, but the lease agreements are two way streets. Um, and, you know, perhaps that could be some of the work of the advisory group because I know some vendors who don't want long-term agreements as well. And, um, and so it's a complex issue and that could be some work of the advisory group to discuss the length of the agreements and things like that. Um, so I had a, another question for Nancy um, and this is going back to the makeup of the advisory group um, and how it outreaches and conducts its business. I, I think that we're hearing concerns. It's safe to say that we're hearing concerns from vendors um, and the community about their fears of being sort of locked out of a process. Um, and no one uh, other than the flea market really has that contact information for the vendors um, and even really knows who they are. Um, and so, in fact, I'm not sure the association does either because of all the limitations that are placed. So um, can you talk to me about how the city could conduct, under the auspices of the advisory group, could conduct outreach um, and make sure to, to really connect with the vendors at the flea market to get input from the actual vendors um, into the advisory group. Thank you very much for the question. We had begun to speak to the flea market representative, Eric Schienauer, about approaching that in two ways, because we very much agree with you. We wanna have as much direct contact as possible, is to work with the, the Bum family to use their uh, methods of uh, reaching out to the vendors to keep those messages flowing. And the other council member is to ask survey that there's a question and ask voluntarily if people would respond to uh, us or perhaps BVFA 
to give their own email or text information so that we could reach out to them. And that would be a voluntary uh, uh, request and fulfillment by the individual vendors. Okay, I just, okay, that's helpful. And I, and I just think that that's an important point to make is once this advisory group is created, since it would be under the city, we have an opportunity to um, ensure that there's some transparency in the process. And I think that's underlying a lot of fears here is having a lack of transparency and having a lack, lack of inclusivity. Um, and so I, um, I think that um, David Cohen's um, amendment incorporates a lot of that, um, acknowledging there's more work to do and, and that some of that work is under our control in terms of outreach and getting that contact information. That's for me, I'll give it back to um, Councilmember Carrasco. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Carrasco, the Zoom is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Um, where did I leave off? Oh, if we could go back to my memo uh, that was dropped today. And, and if you could just put that back up. Uh, I don't know who was in charge of the screen. But if you could share it on the screen, please. I think, Tony, you might have access to that, please. And if we could just, uh, Council Member Cohen, if you could uh, revisit item number one. And uh, uh, Lauren, we talked about this uh, uh, to some extent on Friday. And, uh, and those vendors that were there, the association, they spoke about this. I don't know, is Tony there? Can someone share it, please? Um, perhaps. Am I, what, am I, I'm sorry, I was getting, I was reading a text that was coming in. What am oh, I? I'm sorry. You know, I'm, I have very faulty uh, internet service um, this week because they're fixing it, supposedly. And so I never know if it's me. No, no, it's coming in. Um, Tony, are you able to share the screen with uh, Councilman Carrasco's memorandum? Yes. Thank you. So uh, it's, uh, thank you so much, Tony. And my, my apologies, uh, Lauren, for not getting this to you personally. Uh, but, um, and it was the idea of uh, the, the right of first refusal in the event that that uh, we don't find an operator for the, the urban market. And, uh, and, uh, and I, like, I like your thoughts on this, uh, uh, Council Member Cohen, as well as yours, uh, Lauren, to be able to offer potentially the opportunity to the vendors, uh, specifically, well, uh, any organized association at this point, it, it would be uh, the current association, an opportunity to run it if they had the means to do it, obviously not now, but in the future. Um, and if you'd be willing to accept a friendly amendment. So who you were starting with on that one. Um... And, we did, and we did speak on this on Friday uh, as, uh, as a potential uh, which one are you talking about, number one on your memo? Number one, please. If the property owner were to apply for any planned development permit prior to applying for the PD permit, which is referenced in 3A, the property owner must identify a future developer of the urban market or grant the barriers of flea market vendor association or its chosen entity or successor, a right of first offer and a right of first refusal to lease or purchase the land to develop and operate the urban market. And obviously they're, they're not in a position right now, but uh, we don't know what could happen in the future, uh, uh, what opportunities there may be. And uh, I think Roberto spoke on this very eloquently and very passionately that this truly would allow them uh, an opportunity to have equity 
uh, and a stake in their future um, if they were granted uh, this opportunity? Well, I think that this potential for them to do that is is um, incorporated into the, the specifications of what the advisory group is supposed to do going forward. Um, you know, they're supposed to look into this, and I think you know if they can, if this can be worked out. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think it's a great idea. But tying any potential, every plan development permit that comes forward on this project to that decision being made strikes me as problematic. And I know Nancy has addressed this already about having every PD permit come back to council. Um, but if you want to address that again, Nancy. Um, thank you very much for including me. Uh, the, there's a lot packed into the, the notion and um, staff very much agrees that it would be a great opportunity and uh, to move forward with the vendors being able to run the market and or participate in uh, uh, either with the city owning or a land trust or, or something like that. Just on the particulars, it, it usually happens that you have a right of first offer or a first right of refusal, um, usually one or the other. Um, and Having that, I'm just thinking as you're as you're having it here, council member, having that that it to to say that the the developer would for sure know who the developer of the market would come in. I think that best refers back to the notion in Vice Mayor Jones' memo that when uh, the first market rate housing would come in, they'd have to have a site development permit for the um, urban market, um, and it doesn't necessitate that they have a new developer, but that that would be, uh, one would follow the other more closely in linking back to the first market rate affordable. Uh, Nancy, I'm a little slow. Are you, uh, are you agreeing with me? <laughs> um, so I, I what I am what I'm saying is legally ab absolutely would have to be something done uh, on a voluntary basis by the property owner. Um, the city couldn't impose this and I would turn to Vera to ask if that were so um, and uh, providing trying to get to a place where the, the vendors can, uh, grow into managing the market themselves is what we're all working to on the city side. Okay, great. And so, uh, Vera, your legal opinion, please. Rights of first refusal um, need to be agreed to by the property owner that this is something that they're going to do. Um, they have a monetary value and um, that, that should not be transferred by the council absent um, consent of the property owner. Um, with regard to a first right of acceptance, that's a little bit different of an animal. And my understanding of first rights of acceptance is that the property owner, when they have a deal with a third party, um, can offer the same deal to the vendors, for example. And if the vendors want to accept that, they can accept that. And that has no monetary value because the property is going for the, you know, a similar price, it's the same price as what the market would bear. And, um, it, but again, in either scenario, um, the, the landowner needs to offer that and be okay with that. Uh, so, so again, uh, and I understand that, um, that, uh, that we'd be working towards uh, preparing, training, offering technical assistance, uh, which is, Fantastic. Uh, this is what we want to make sure that our, our vendors, our small business owners, our micro business owners, uh, that we can offer this kind of uh, uh, technical support. This is one of the reasons why I, I submitted my budget document for an east side uh, business manager, because we know that our businesses have been hurting because of the pandemic. And so we want to make sure that we have a, a thriving uh, business uh, um, uh, community. 
and uh, our small business owners uh, at, the, at La Pulga, the flea market, is no different. So, uh, so in the event that uh, the Bum family or the flea market Inc. is not operating uh, the urban market, um, uh, I go back to the same question. Uh, can we um, uh, submit to uh, Mr. Lauren and, and the Bum family uh, a request to um, uh, to include in this um, in this uh, uh, wonderful uh, agreement with the vendors and with the family uh, a right of for, of uh, what is it a right of first refusal or a right of first offer with the vendors. Thank you, Council Member Carrasco. Your your question is thoughtful, and and uh, I understand um, where it's coming from. Um, let me just say that I think as an organization, we believe and we're committed to this process, and we're committed to the process that's envisioned by the memo that's before you today, um, and in that, the creation of this flea market vendors uh, advisory group. Uh, which could it be empowered with any and all of these directives that the city um, and its members want to, want to engage or employ. Um, from what I can provide today, though, uh, I, 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 cannot, uh, I cannot authorize any of this because that would require going back to the ownership group um, and discussing this and vetting the implications and the ramifications of what's contemplated here um, on any future transaction involving this property uh, it's a, it's a it's a, a big ask at, at a at a late stage in this proceeding that that I, I simply can't commit to one way or the other uh, thank you for thank you for um, thank you for the that that uh, thank you for that. Uh, you know, um, I, I hope that the, the dialogue continues, and I, I think through the advisory uh, group it will. Uh, I do hope that as, as we move forward, you know, it's, it's, it really is my hope that, um, that we, we start to, to look to see how we offer uh, these folks who I think have been, you know, um, They've been wonderful partners uh, between the family and uh, and the business community and the city of San Jose. Uh, together, these three partners have built an incredible community, um, and and just uh, really figure out how do we how do we create opportunities and wealth and equity so that we can create a sense of security for generations to come. Uh, and and it, it, it really is just it, it really is my hope that that these families don't continue to live, you know, uh, paycheck to paycheck, but rather start to see themselves as investors in their future, and that and that the Bum family who has been so incredibly successful uh, teach and guide. Uh, the the principles that they've learned from, uh, and and can impart that kind of wisdom. Uh, truly, uh, you you embody the American dream, and uh, and and I hope that 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 can be shared. Um, anyway, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, thank you so much for for your patience. Thank you, Councilmember Prowse. Yeah, uh, two last uh, requests here. Um, number one, the first request um, would be, uh, I'm curious on if we could come back to maybe tackle this, this dilemma on my memo 1B on this makeup of the flea market advisory group where maybe we don't uh, we don't have to address it the complete makeup of it today because it is going to be you know overseen by the city. I'm wondering if we can that way we, maybe we can 
sort of agree to disagree right now, but then agree to, to come back and have that conversation on the actual makeup of the advisory group. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking similarly of what we did with the stationary advisory group. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a major project that we all understood impacted um, our city. And although it was, uh, you know, within the, the districts of myself and, and Council Member Davis, um, we all chimed in and had, uh, well, the council at the time, all chimed in and, and, and had uh, a lot to say around who should make up that advisory group. And I think similarly, if this is going to be city led, um, it sounds like where this is where there's a little bit of a difference of opinion on on exactly who makes up the group. Uh, maybe we rather than you know have a definitive on it today, is this something that we could bring back? So first I'll ask uh, Nora or Vera, is this something we could bring back? And then I'll ask if, if that is possible, if Councilmember Cohen would be comfortable with that. Vera, do you want to? take that one on um, I'm not sure if it's tied into the approvals that need to be made today um well one of the the approvals sort su suppose that there is going to be five million dollars put into this committee and that the committee will have certain functions as far as the membership you could certainly say something you know like that a flea market advisory group um, consisting of vendors, vendors representatives, the property owner slash developer and the city will be created um, by the city council. And, and then you, the council could decide at a future date what that composition looks like or who the members will be. That is, that is what I am hoping that we have a conversation of. So that last sentence you just stated would be what I was looking for is, you know, so all the language that we've accepted today moves forward, but it gives us an opportunity on the, the composition, the makeup of it, to have that conversation conversation at a future date. So it sounds like that is and possible. I, and I would add, it is possible, but I would also add that given that this is being funded by the developer, by the, by the applicant, let's see if they're okay with that concept. Customer Prowse, you may be muted right now if you're trying to talk. I think I wasn't. Sorry. I think Lauren was. Okay. I'm. I am. Uh, I am contemplating that. I don't. I don't think. Um, I don't think in 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 theory I have an opposition for 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 a part of this that, that can be addressed later. I'm. Um, I, I would only hope that 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 this matter that I guess is sort of bifurcated. Is that correct? Where where the the rest of the um, memo would be addressed today by the council, except for this provision, which would be um, carried future. Uh, slightly different. I actually, the way Vera was stating is actually the language that Councilmember Cohen has agreed to right now would move forward, but we would add on to it one sentence at the end that would state that the actual composition of this new advisory group would come back to the council um, for discussion, because it, since we're not getting as specific today, and that's what I think, you know, Councilmember Cohen had some anxieties with as well around, you know, half or what that, that that we would, we're sort of setting up the bare bones of it today, and then we we agree that we'll come back uh, in the future to talk about the actual composition. Yeah, I, I think that's fine. I, I think at some point you're this, there's going to have to be some definition to this group and and and, and its composition. So. I, I don't necessarily see a problem with that. Is that is that comfortable with the maker of the motion? Yeah, I mean, I, I very much trust Nancy and her office to do a good job of putting together this committee, but I don't have a problem with bringing back that recommendation that they put together to be ratified by the council at such time as it's ready. Okay, thank you. And then the other is in regards to uh, a friendly amendment on, now I'm looking back at your your, a uh, memo from last week again with uh, Councilman Jimenez and Licardo. On item 2B, you were asking for uh, some, the owner submitting written quarterly status reports to the director of PBCE that summarize all the construction, planning, permitting activities. Um, I have two requests on that. Number one would be, could we 
also get an indication in that report or just have it you know reported in that report on if anybody has been uh you know uh displaced or relocated or or had their their lease terminated in that in that time frame so each of those quarterly reports getting a status on that as well i think that's in the spirit of what's already expected there so that that's fine with me okay it's, it was when explicitly stated so if that you're good with that then thank you i appreciate that and then the other thing would be rather than having it coming to the director of pbce only um those are quarterly reports where maybe we you know to a, a committee um like ced where it actually has a check-in as well so on top of those quarterly reports then you know we're we're we're, we're actually having those courts those quarterly reports surface um on another frequency, it doesn't have to be quarterly, obviously, but but coming forward to CED. I think that's fine. I think the intent is that people would have visibility to this report. So whatever whatever process there is to do that through, through the committee makes sense. But that's fine with me. So maybe, I don't know what you want to do, say twice a year it comes to the committee or something like that. Yeah, I'm good with that. Yeah, I'll, I'll accept that. Okay, there were two friendly amendments that were accepted. I uh, just want to make sure they're comfortable with the secondary. Yes. Great, thank you. And then just for clarification, um, on Councilmember uh, Carrasco's memo, um, she had had uh, this direction for staff uh, to contribute at least 5 million matching the proposed contribution from the Bum family. Um, so that is recommendation six, and she spells that out. And then, um, uh, I believe she had recommendation five from from before, uh, which was one and two uh, of her memo from last week, which talks about matching the 2.5 with the American Rescue Plan, which I believe that's addressed in the mayor's memo. Um, and I just wanted to to, to see where, where the, I, I don't recall if that was just accepted um, that direction as well. Which part are you asking whether one and two from her June 22nd memo? Uh, I believe one is now contemplated within the mayor's memo, so I think that one's... Well, one and two are already part of the main motion that's on the floor. Okay, so those those are already in there. So then it would just be five then of uh, her, oh, excuse me, not five, six of her, her current memo. I don't know if you, I don't know if she had just asked for that and I missed it. No, it hasn't been brought up. I mean, I, uh, you know, that's, that's doubling the city's commitment from what's in the memo already of two and a half to five, and I'm not, I mean... You know, I, I don't have a strong feeling about the dollars. That's if that should be a question that I want to hear from the council on. But you know, um, I, I think that the mayor's memo contemplates figuring out all the various avenues by which additional money will be put into the into the fund. So I'm not, you know, I don't know that we need this because I think that's already there's already an intent to figure out what's the how, what we can do and how much we can get. Let me ask, and I guess I, I didn't hear, it sounds like it wasn't brought up. So I, I'll, let me ask Councilmember Carrasco. Uh, it sounds like this is superseding then the 2.5 million that, that you had originally contemplated last week. Um, can you speak to this number six that you that you suggested for today? Well, Matt, it was, Matt, uh, it was uh, moving from the two and a half to the five. So it was matching the Bum family. And then, and then giving a goal, it looks like as well, of trying to raise money, but that, that obviously is not necessarily set in stone, but the contribution that you're looking at would be doubling what you, the 2.5, correct? That's the, that's the main gist of this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I believe, well, let me look at the mayor's memo, because mayor, you suggested as well, um, some language for this. I don't know if you can speak to. Yeah. Um... I yeah. offer some options for us to consider, including um, essentially advancing what could be tax revenues or fee revenue that we could generate from the project. The concern I have, I, I didn't set a number, in part because we've had zero analysis, understanding what exactly it's going to cost. And we have actually zero analysis and understanding how many participants, how many vendors actually even need to be helped because we're going to be looking at this five acre concept. Hopefully we're going to be looking at expansion into BTA space as well, uh, if BTA is willing, but I know five board members that should help. Um, you know, there could be a substantial 
possibility that we could accommodate uh, all or nearly all uh, the vendors who want to be there, certainly on the weekend, which is sort of the peak time for them to be there. And we know during the weekday, it's it's a much, much less active market. So I, I, I just think what we really want to understand is what is the need first before we start deciding how much. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I can understand that. I, I know that we we have 2.5 million that we're already contemplating in the in the motion. I appreciate that, and I uh, I think it is a great sign to try and see you know what we can do to to match that and where there are dollars. I know that you were suggesting maybe ARP, and it sounds like maybe that's not possible now, but there are other avenues. Um, so I'm comfortable with with where the current direction is at in in that regard. I'll I'll. I'll end by, I think, stating I, I appreciate all the movement that, that's happened since last week. I think uh, it, it goes to show that there certainly was, um, you know, benefit out of out of that deferral and trying to get us um, even closer to where I feel is, is um, you know, the best the best path forward. I think for for me, one of the major concerns is just an opportunity to come back in the future uh, in front of the council, and that's really with these plan development permits. And um, I think that, you know, I, I would like to see officially all of them, but I think in trying to be um, fair and, and seeing really where is the, the, the meat of this issue, it's around displacement of, of vendors. And, um, and I think, you know, that, that for me should be a, a, a point of interest for the entire council as an opportunity to come back um, to, to hear on these development permits, because that's when we're really going to be able to see what is going to get developed. Do we actually make good on um, what it is that we're trying to create here on, on creating an urban market? Is it going to be able to accommodate everybody? Uh, were we able to achieve something with VTA or BART? Um, all of those things. If, if we don't come back for a plan development permit in front of the council, uh, then it's simply a director's hearing. And so I think that this at the moment is, is too limited of when it's gonna come back for a plan development permit. It's better than, than nothing. And, I, and I, I understand it also, right? We, we're including the, the vice mayor's memo. So I think that that's, you know, it's, it's good progress, um, but it, in my mind, uh, it's not su sufficient for where we would wanna see, um, have this conversation come back. So uh, thank you though, again, for, for uh, the dialogue on this. Council Member Sparson. Thank you. Um, I uh, wanted to just thank the vendors and thank my colleagues for all the work that they've done on this. Um, and uh, especially Council Member Cohen for taking the input uh, in particular from Council Member Perales's motion, Vice Mayor Jones's memo and Council Member Carrasco's memo to follow up over the weekend. Um, and I wanted to comment on the mayor's uh, memo uh, submitted today, right? Yes, today. Um, and, uh, and just say how much I appreciate going to VTA and working with VTA and BART. I think that's what will hopefully be a great solution. And um, we could be as well known as Barcelona and Las Ramblas that they have over there, and that could be a Las Ramblas for San Jose. So um, I thought that was kind of creative, and so I just wanted to give some feedback on that, and that this is a beginning, um, not an end, and that I'm hopeful that under the city's advisory group that we're able to really incorporate the input from the Barrios Flea Market Association. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councilmember Sparta. Just a reference to the memorandum that I did submit. Um, first, I want to make sure I, I level set expectations. I have had some conversations with BTA staff. There was some pushback because BART, of course, has some say in this, and BART had apparently a bad experience with a flea market on another station, and so uh, we're going to need to do some pushing. Um, but the good news is, you know, again, I do know five members of the BTA board, so that's helpful. Uh, and with this direction, hopefully everybody will be on board together uh, pushing so that uh, we could make something happen in areas where, I mean, I've been to the BART station several times on weekends and it's pretty dead. There's no reason why I would imagine there couldn't be space, um, contiguous space that would be offered. 
um, if uh, so we had some sensible limits on it. Um, with regard to the funding, um, I, I just wanted to ask of Nancy. Well, first, Nancy, I think you had some questions yourself about um, the distinction whether vendors stay on site or not. Do you want to clarify that? Mayor, thank you very much. I was wondering if it would be useful to make a distinction on the PD permit requirement that if the vendors were accommodated on site or at VTA in perhaps an interim situation, would that be acceptable in lieu of bringing back PD permits if we knew there were a, a close by additional site? Okay, that's a question I think for Council Member Cohen to make a motion. Um, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, for me, that's acceptable. I, I don't, I don't know how we put we, we wordsmith that all together right now on the fly. I mean, I, I think the, the main included in the main motion was contemplation that an alternative site could be found that would accommodate the flea market, and if that happened, it would satisfy everything, but. I don't know how we, you know, predicate everything else in the memo on that item, but, you know, I'll leave that there. I don't know what else to say about that. Um, well, my suggestion would be either you would make an amendment that would incorporate it somehow, uh, or uh, we simply leave it for staff to figure out. I mean, my my preference at this point is this is the latter, <laughs> but I, I I'm um, I'm okay with 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 maybe just a clarifying statement at the end of the motion that says, you know, if the flea market finds an alternative location, then the other uh, then other elements as appropriate are no longer you know no longer required or something like that. I don't, I don't know how to word it, but and I'm willing to put that in there if that helps everybody. Okay, is that okay with the seconder? That is, that makes sense. Okay. Um, just Nancy, I've had some conversations, you know, with some property owners just to see how we could accommodate more vendors who were willing to sort of fledge into a, a more permanent space. And um, recently I had a conversation with one broker of a, of a site in East San Jose where you know, about 20,000 square feet, but it's a cold shell um, and needs some tenant improvements. And I guess the question is, um, can we use public money to help build out tenant improvements if we had say 20 or 30 vendors ready to move into a, a site? Is that is that an allowable use or do, typically does this, does this public money and the grant money have to be used in, in other ways? Um. Thank you for the question, Mayor, and I will ask uh, Nora and Vera. Um, my understanding is that ARP dollars couldn't be used in that manner, um, but that like redevelopment agency days, there could be loans and or grants, but that would require prevailing wage and other requirements. Right. So we'd have to look at that and also look at the financial feasibility of the, if there's additional cost burden. Right. Uh, and I think that that mayor could well be part of our analysis, the economic feasibility, what vendors could sustain a, a, a retail rent. Right. And then pursue opportunities if there are vendors that could pursue. Yeah, and I appreciate that. I think the notion would be that we'd have not a standard retail size, but again, an urban market, so there'd be much smaller stalls than you'd have mm -hmm. in a standard retail. And so hopefully that burden would be a bit less on them um, for those landowners to recognize the opportunity that's created when you have a, a critical mass uh, of vendors who can attract uh, customers, hopefully. Um, so I, I, who on your team should we be <laughs> talking to about those conversations? We're going to follow up with, we'll have a team from OED that consists of three or four people that will work with the vendors in selecting consultants. And so it would be a combination of staff and the selected consultant with, of course, the vendor's input. Okay. Well, I've got a couple sites uh, ready to go. So just let me know. <laughs> I'll be happy to connect them. Uh, Councilman Carrasco. 
Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I just want to, again, I, I just want to reaffirm my gratitude to the vendors for, uh, you know, uh, being very patient during this process and coming out on on Friday and we had a very lengthy conversation and uh, and I'm uh, I want to thank the council my council colleagues on Tuesday for voting on the continuation of this item I know it it it, uh, it wasn't necessarily an easy vote uh, but I I, I appreciate uh, the time that uh, all of you gave the vendors. Uh, to have a, a dialogue, uh, they they felt uh, a, a real need to be at the table and to have their voices heard and to have a, a dialogue, uh, and uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate it because many of these vendors and their families they live in my district, and all of you know that District Five, the East Side of San Jose, was the hardest hit uh, district during the pandemic, and so when La Pulga was shut down. Uh, their businesses were were shut down. They lost income. Uh, I'm sure that they had to get very creative in figuring out how to make ends meet and how to feed their families and how to keep the lights on in their homes. And so I, I appreciate uh, my council colleagues for their vote on the continuation. And this has not been an easy uh, or, or a simple uh, process uh, or project and, uh, and for staff as well. Uh, Development and progress is uh, not an easy journey, and uh, and it's not a, it's not um, it's not easy to grow up. There's a lot of growing pains, and so um, you know, with that, uh, I want to tell the vendors, you know, um, aquí estamos con ustedes y les doy las gracias a todos por uh, por su paciencia y por el esfuerzo que han hecho durante todos estos años. Muchísimas gracias por todo lo que han contribuido a la ciudad de San José. Estoy eternamente agradecida porque cada uno de ustedes ha contribuido, aunque sea un granito de arena, a lo que ha sido una, una historia increíble durante estos últimos 60 años de la ciudad de San José. Realmente son ustedes un modelo para la ciudad de San José. Estoy muy agradecida y realmente... Uh, me siento muy orgullosa porque puedo utilizarlos a cada uno de ustedes como un ejemplo para mis hijos. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much for all that you do. Uh, and I, I look forward to the ongoing relationship that the advisory group will have with the city of San Jose, with the Bum family, uh, and with our, um, with our ongoing, uh, uh, I hope, progress. The last thing I'll say, uh, Mayor and Council colleagues, staff, and to the Bum family, uh, you know, for 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 me, this has been also an issue of equity. Uh, we keep talking about uh, making decisions based on a an equity lens, and this could not be more of an example of uh, of making decisions with that lens of equity. This is primarily an immigrant community. Uh, you know, it started 60 years ago. Uh, it has flourished into a magnificent community that exemplifies the spirit of entrepreneurship uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and all of you are intertwined and braided into the journey, a magnificent journey of, uh, of immigrants who came here to realize the American dream. A lot of these families have now birthed uh, the, the first or second now generation of children who are graduating from very prestigious universities, by the way, and these are unbelievably intelligent human beings who are contributing to our city in the most amazing uh, ways. And uh, I don't doubt that one day they will be sitting in these seats uh, if they so choose, or they will be contributing in even greater ways, uh, ways that I can't even imagine. So, uh, so with that, um, uh, I hope that we continue to uh, use them as our North Star and continue to make the decisions with that lens of equity. All right, um, Councilman Prowlis, could I urge you to be as succinct as possible because we've got a very, very long agenda. And I know there's been a lot of dialogue already. Yes, no, these are, these are parting words, Mayor. Um, so I, I, I think in, in the spirit of, of obviously collaboration and, and negotiation uh, and not completely 
pleased with uh, I think the the the, the outcome uh, attempted to to get what I felt were were some important friendly amendments, but. Uh, I do believe that we have likely gotten this as far as as it's going to go, and uh, and again, I appreciate how far we've come since just last week, and uh, want to thank the vendors as well as Councilmember Carrasco just did uh, for for your spirit um, and and really for for helping this council move uh, this along in a better direction. And thank you to Councilmember Cohen for your, uh, as well, your, your uh, participation, negotiating on this, being willing to uh, be open to some of these, uh, these changes over the last couple of weeks. Um, and uh, I, I will reluctantly uh, support the item moving forward and look forward to the continued dialogue, especially with the advisory group and the, the, the future uh, development permits as they come forward. Thank you. Uh, I also appreciate uh, all of the I'm sorry, Vera, did you have something briefly? Uh, you're not, you're muted right now, Vera. We're not able to hear you. Vera, there sorry you go. About that. I really didn't want to interrupt the council's comments, but there is a substitute CEQA resolution for the flea market item in the council's packet. And it is identified as item number, it's um, parentheses A, resolution parentheses two. And that was intended to be approved if the council were to accept the property owner's offers. And what we, um, we would like the council to consider that as the sequel resolution that it adopts for the flea market item. And also to um, a, adopt a, a couple of changes to that resolution because that was prepared for last week. Um, since we now have the uh, June 28th offer from the property owner, we would like to incorporate that letter into the resolution, into that language, and also incorporate the change from $2.5 million to $5 million. Okay, that be part of the motion, Councilmember Cohen? Yes, I'll add that to the motion. And Councilmember Thank Mendes? You. Yes. Thank you. All right, thank you for making those changes. Uh, I want to also thank all the vendors, uh, particularly those who have been working collaboratively to try to find uh, a path to be able to uh, certainly protect what is critical to their livelihoods as well as to the life of our community. I wanna thank um, all the, the folks uh, who have been part of this effort on the, the side of the, uh, the flea market and Bunk family uh, for their uh, willingness to make, I think, important concessions around ensuring five acres will continue to be available, uh, plus hopefully what, whatever we can get to add to that, uh, $5 million to help with any transition. And perhaps what must be, must, might be most important is, is the time, the three years of time uh, to enable, if there is going to be a transition, to enable folks to be able to, to make good decisions for themselves and their families. Uh, so I appreciate that. I appreciate uh, Councilmember Cohen's leadership on this. It's been an extraordinarily difficult and complex endeavor, and I appreciate the work of him and his entire team in getting us here. So with that, let's vote on his motion. Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Carrasco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. See, that was unanimous. It wasn't so hard. Okay. Uh, we're on to item 3.3. Thanks, everybody, for your work. Uh, thank you, Nancy, Vera, everyone who's worked so hard on this. Uh, Rosalind, thank you. Uh, okay, uh, under the appeals hearing board interviews, this is item 3.3. I think it should be interview singular rather than plural, I, I suspect. Um, I believe we have one candidate. Is that right, Tony? There is one candidate. He texted me to say that he could not make it today. Um, we did confirm last week, but he had to work today. So okay. he can appoint without interview, or we could reschedule him to interview on the first meeting of August. Okay. Now we got two positions here. One goes till 20. 21, the end of this year, the other goes to 2025. Is that right? Yeah, that's actually the same person in the same position. Um, because it's less than six month term, we oh. can adopt, we can appoint to the, the subsequent term. 
Okay, so we could consider to either uh, 2021 or to 2025. Is that, yes. is that right? All right. Yes. Like is if you motion? wanted to, if you wanted to appoint without interview for just the term to the end of this year, and then have him come back to interview for uh, the full term, you could do that. Okay. What's the pleasure of the council? I'll move uh, approval just to the appointment of uh, the term this year. Second. Okay, so he'll come back for an interview after December, is that right? Or before December? Yes. Okay, okay. motion second. Any comments? All right, let's vote. Menes? Yes. Rallis? Yes. John? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Sparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, uh, on to item 3.4, hybrid meetings. Um, Tony, did you want to make any presentation here or did we? Sorry, I was still writing down the, the votes on the last one. Um, I have no presentation. We already did um, our presentation with the city managers on the first meeting in June. Um, right. I'm here to answer questions though. Okay, all right, let's go to public uh, discussion first and comment. Uh, Tessa Woodman. Thank you, hi, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I basically have been writing all of you about the importance of keeping the virtualization of our meetings going. Um, the reasons um, are many fold. Um, climate change is the biggest reason actually. And then secondly for me is because I'm immune compromised with my multiple sclerosis um, from the, all the pollution in my neighborhood. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, I'm not going into buildings and so this is, you know, and like my son brought up, there's a lot of people that don't go, you know, can't come into the business, into the city hall. And so to really for democratic, um, uh, um, you know, uh, improving our democracy, this has done that of, of virtualization has increased our participation. <coughs> and, you know, the like mothers who can't leave, you know, because they have children to take care of, a lot of issues. But, the, you know, the main issue is, is the externalities of uh, going to city hall through our Okay, thank you. Uh, I believe we have uh, Claire. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Um, uh, I'm surprised you didn't talk a little more about this subject. It's important. Uh, I, I think it deserves a little bit more public time about it. I will try to review whatever the city manager's meeting was of early June that uh, Tony talked about. The VTA will be doing some hybrid meetings starting in August as well, as well as uh, other Bay Area city councils and, and governments. Uh, I hope we all can learn from each other at this time. Uh, what Martha O'Connell has been really promoting about this uh, and what Tessa just said, it should be really interesting practices. Um, you know, with the uh, events of May of the VTA, we had a really difficult June here in San Jose. I think you guys really, really closed down uh, the public process. And I understand grieving is important. Let's hope we can really open up the public process again in August. Thank you. Paul Soto. Uh, yeah, I wanted to thank you for um, for uh, creating this policy for, for the city because what the hybrid has been able to do for people like me is that it has balanced power. Now, now, now I can exercise powers where you, I had to physically be somewhere. And so while I look forward to, to being in the room because there's no substitute for having me experiencing your energy, this has been very depersonalizing. Although it is a, it ostensibly, it's democratic, but it is dehumanizing because I'm not sitting there and experiencing your energy because as you're making decisions, you have all this electricity going on in your body. And I wanna be able to resonate that with that when these decisions are made that are going to impact my life. And so uh, again, I look forward to uh, 
to participating in both uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Hi, I'm speaking um, as a resident of District 3 and as a mother of the community um, this time. And I just wanted to say that I highly encourage that you continue doing this hybrid. I know for myself, my children go to school in District 2. Um, you can imagine I would have job in public policy that it is extremely hard to manage all of that. Um, and these hybrid meetings, I have had community um, engagement that with on a higher level and people have really talked about being able to engage. So I just really encourage you to keep this model. I think it's working and I think it's something that we should normalize and keep going um, from the pandemic in a positive way. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sophia. Sophia, Pierce, your device is still muted. Sophia, Oops, there you go. Sorry. No problem. Yes, sorry. And I think it's under the wrong last name, uh, the wrong name. It's Veronica. That's one of my daughters. Um, so yes, I'm also here on advocating for this hybrid model um, as a mother and as well as a constituent. Um, not only am I listening to the meetings, but my children are. And my children are starting to ask questions and they're starting to uh, really think about <laughs> beyond what I could explain to them and think about like, oh, those people are not making the right decisions, right? And having conversations that empower them. Um, and so I hope that this type model, is, as a mother, I'm able to participate, but also as uh, just a person, just like Paul Soto mentioned, it has been myself power and it has given my children power and understanding the system. And I a lot of mothers have as well their children are also listening and learning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, reminder for all of us to keep it clean. We got kids listening. Uh, the person with phone number ending 4963. Yeah, hi, Martha O'Connell. In letters from the public, there is a letter signed by all the then current housing commissioners as individuals. That letter clearly outlines the immense benefits of hybrid meetings to increase public participation. I now speak to the issue of protecting immunocompromised commissioners and or commissioners who are caregivers for medically vulnerable people. To protect our safety, we need to be able to attend by Zoom. I urge the city to communicate with our legislators in the strongest possible terms to amend the Brown Act. The disabled and the medically vulnerable have much to contribute. The city should do everything it can to facilitate their contributions in safety so they don't have to choose participation over their health. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Uh, the person then, phone number 5140. Yeah, let's keep with the hybrid meetings. I mean, do you guys really wanna see me at City Hall? Do I wanna see you people at City Hall? Not really. This is off of my phone and it works well. I mean, when things start to heat up and you guys really, you know, want want to start taking people's rights away and raising up the fines and the fees, I'll come down there, you know, but this way, this enables, I like it because this way you guys can't have me walked out by, by the local pot-bellied uh, cop who stands in, in the uh, city hall meeting there. And I mean, and who wants to see the pictures of the past mayor, mayors, including Hammer? I see that picture. I, yay. Terrible. I mean, you might want to just t move the Columbus statue back in in front of that picture. I swear to God. Anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, keep it hybrid because I don't want to see you. You don't want to see me. I don't even watch you guys on Zoom. So, you know, we can just keep, we can just keep it like a phone conversation like we're doing now. Person, the phone number 1541. Hi, my name is Glenna Halcroft, and I am a disabled U.S. Army veteran. Due to the increased pain from long-standing neck and back injuries, I'm no longer able to sit or stand for extended periods of time. Thus, being able to attend HCDC and City Council meetings via Zoom has proven to be a lifeline for me. San Jose residents whose life situations prevent attendance to in-person meetings now have the opportunity to do so thanks to Zoom. Therefore, I ask the City Council to preserve the hybrid meetings. We need this service to continue. Thanks much. Bye-bye. 
Thank you. Uh, Brenda, welcome. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Brenda Sendejas. I am a resident from District 5. And I do want to encourage you guys to continue to use the hybrid model. Uh, the hybrid model has worked for us moms who have children at home. And we got things to do. And we can actually, you know, pop in and make our comments whenever we, um, we have time. I also think that this encourages people who can't speak in public um, scenes, right? They get anxiety. This gives them a little bit more boost to participate. And it's also create a unity in amongst all of us who uh, can collectively come together through a phone and um, stand up when, you know, things happen in our city. It has taught us a lot about city governance. And it has also um, shown us that we can speak up and we can encourage those who have never done it through a phone. So I just want to thank you guys for this. Thank you. Thank you. Maria? I uh, guess, good afternoon. I'm a constituent from District 7. Um, I do agree. Um, I'm in favor of maintaining the hybrid meetings. Um, it's definitely allowed for me, who um, I work in healthcare and have a very limited schedule, um, to participate um, with issues, but also it's allowed uh, for my extended uh, family to participate as well, given that it's virtually and they are monolingual. So I'm able to uh, live translate for them on issues that uh, affect them and affect us as a family. So I am in favor of maintaining the hybrid meetings. I think it'll allow for larger uh, community participation in a city where unfortunately um, there are, you know, the community for the most part can be apathetic. So I am in favor of the hybrid meetings. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's go back to the council now. Councilmember Foley. Thank you. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm happy to see this item come before us. I want to thank all the members of the public who spoke up in support of hybrid meetings. I think hybrid meetings can work really well. As you heard, moms and dads and People who are working can listen to us and pay attention and uh, call in when they have a moment. And it's also a teachable moment for some of those parents, which I think is wonderful for their kids to be exper experiencing uh, local government in, in the way that they are. That's really wonderful that you're enabling, the parents who are doing that are enabling their parent, their kids to listen to those conversations. Um, I do have some questions. And uh, mostly it's about the commissioners as it relates to the, their public uh, accessibility to the meetings or their, their being able to participate virtually. I'm very concerned about the, them um, having to disclose where they live, having to uh, via, uh, disclose their privacy. As I said last time this came before us, as, as uh, elected officials, everybody knows how to get a hold of us and probably knows where we live. We, we, uh, we raise our hand for that kind of access, but the commissioners don't necessarily. So I'm wondering, last time we brought the, this was brought to us, we talked about a legislative fix. So Lee, I'm wondering where any legislation stands to modify the Brown Act so that we can allow our commissioners to participate virtually. Thank you, Council Member Foley, Lee Wilcox, Deputy City Manager. Um, so there's a few different bills moving their way through assembly local government and moving on uh, their way through the Senate. Um, our IGR team has meetings this week with assembly member Lee's office on specific follow-ups around this privacy concern, not only for commissioners, but also council members. And I know the League of Cities is trying to address it as well. So it, it seems to be a lot of different concerns around local government participation and security for those who participate. Um, there is opposition to, to some of these ideas through um, ACLU and others. So I don't wanna say it's an uphill battle, um, but there is opposition to it. So I think is the, you know, the, the state legislature adjourns in July as well. Um, when they come back in August, that's gonna be a very busy time for them as the bills in the assembly or in the Senate working their way through committees. We'll have a, a variety of opportunities with 
different coalitions to try and insert this language. So it remains, um, you know, on our agenda, something that we're trying to push, but we technically yet don't have a, a very specific remedy that would address this, or at least that's been, um, has a pathway forward at this exact moment. Okay, uh, can you give me an idea of timing? And the reason I'm asking is because the memo, the, the recommendation is that we move to in-person commissioner meetings in October. And, and I'm concerned that we're not gonna have the legislation to correct or amend anything by that time. Is that, Lee, is that a, a fair assessment that October may be too soon to reconvene? or to consider to have the commissioner meetings in person? It possibly could, yes. Anything that's passed by the legislature this year and signed by the governor without an urgency ordinance technically doesn't go into effect until January 1 the following year. Um, but I will say assembly local government um, committee and, and our team has met with the consultant there. They have talked about urgency clause. And I know at least in speaking to the governor's office, and, and I don't know if Mayor Licardo's heard more from his meetings with the governor, um, that whatever flexibility the governor's granted with the emergency orders that really, um, they, they stop now on September 30th, that there are a few issues like this and a few others that might require just additional time to sort out and that could be carried forward. So I do feel like there's enough uh, cities and other entities besides us trying to figure this out in Sacramento collectively and we just need additional time to sort it out so hopefully in in late August we can do a little bit more of an additional report I know on the second meeting of August we're scheduled to do a larger intergovernmental relations update so we can specifically talk about this and any updates that um, come through over the summer and, and Lee, I, I should just butt in and say, we, we haven't, I haven't been involved in any conversations like that with the governor. All of our conversations have been around homeless funding. So I'm sorry, I don't have anything to add. Mm -mm. Okay, so just to clarify, per the governor's order, October would be the end of virtual meetings for our boards and commissions. Is that correct? And to change that, we can't utilize, can we utilize, can we today say we're going to extend that to December 31st, or do we have to wait for the legislator to make that change? We can't do that unless the governor do, does that because it, it's a, a policy at the governor's, at the state level. Um, yes, Tony Tabor, City Clerk, the Brown Act, we can't bypass it. We can make it more strict, but we can't make it less strict. So like, you know, our sunshine, we have to post 10 days out, Brown Act is 72. That's the, that's the only way we can really mess with the Brown Act. Um, we can't make it more lax. So I, I argued this already too, because I wanted to keep the boards and commissions virtual for much longer, but we, we can't. I would love to. I think it's, it's a great thing to have for the boards and commissions. I think we'd have more people applying for boards and commissions if they have the flexibility to be able to attend virtually. I just don't have that authority. Okay, thank you, Tony. That really helps me. I, I absolutely agree with you that we would get more individuals interested and able to participate if they could do so virtually instead of having to drive down to City Hall, but I understand that our hands are tied until we get a legislative fix. So I, I really, I'm completely in support of the hybrid meetings. Uh, I personally, I look forward to getting back in person to the city council meetings so I can, that dynamic that Paul Soto mentioned of uh, being in person, that I can then experience that dynamic with my fellow council members and, and staff. That's really important for us to be able to work together and collaborate face-to-face -face rather than through a Zoom meeting. So I'm very anxious for August. Uh, not too anxious because I've got July and I need to take a big break just like the rest of us, but I will be hit the ground running in August with those new meetings in person. So with that, I will move uh, the staff recommendation. Second. Second. And with that, Thank I'm you. finished. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Mayhem. Thanks, Mayor. And um, just want to thank my um, colleagues first for collaborating 
on the rules memo that we put together. So thank you to Mayor Licardo, Vice Mayor Jones, uh, Council Members Foley and Jimenez for working together on the rules memo that we brought forward about a month ago. And um, actually it was more than that now. And, um, and, a, and a big thanks to Tony, Kip, Lee and, and others who I know um, on the staff side have been working really hard to ensure that we can support these hybrid meetings going forward. I think uh, Council Member Foley already oh, yeah. said it, but as, as we all heard from our public testimony today, just um, the, the look, I think there's a ton of value in lowering barriers to public participation and making it easier and more convenient for people to uh, to participate. So I'm excited about this. Um, Council were fully focused on one of the issues I was also concerned about. And just to clarify, as, as I was reading the memo, my understanding of the executive order um, it was number in uh, 29-20, I believe, um, that's in place through September 30th. So, so that means that council members would in theory, I'm also excited to get back in person just to be clear, but in theory, council members, for example, would be able to participate through that date without disclosing their location, participate remotely, I should say. And then after that date would need to disclose their location in order to participate via Zoom remotely. Is that is that an accurate reading of that? Yes. Okay, just wanted to clarify, great. Uh, so also share the concern that Council Member Foley raised, would love to help with advocacy if appropriate, and um, you know, hope that that's something we can, we can help address at the state level. The, the other thing I wanted to just follow up on, Tony, was the section on staffing, as I remember reading it, essentially said that you need more support, but then I think left next steps open-ended. I hope I didn't misread that, but if, if that is the case, uh, do you mind just describing next steps on ensuring that you have the staff capacity to actually manage this transition and whether or not we, I don't believe we're being asked to consider any action specific to that today, but just wanted to get a little more context. Yeah, we, we haven't done a, a budget appropriation for this yet. Um, Jim Shannon said that would come next. Um, I know that we're going to need AV staff. I think that's the, the biggest one. Um, because like right now, we just did a test last week, the camera's like static, we can do a wide shot, but we, we don't have the staffing to manage Zoom and be able to move the cameras around. Um, so that is something we would, we would come back. But we're also kind of playing it like what, we kind of did worst case scenario, what we think we need. Um, it's possible we need less. I think we'll know more as we go into our tests in July. Yeah, understood there'll be a period of, of trial and error and appreciate that. And, and I'm sure we'll all, we'll all be patient and supportive as you work through that. I guess my only other question related to that is, and I know we're not voting on this today, but I'm curious as you're doing that experimentation, if you'll be assessing uh, duplicative technologies related to streaming, I know this has come up in past items. So can you just give us a sense uh, I, I certainly don't have a full picture of when you're managing these public meetings. Um, it seems to me there's some overlap between some of the streaming technologies that we had pre-COVID and now with the introduction of Zoom. Is that is that fair to say? Yes, I am not the expert in that. And Craig, um, who manages the broadcast, has explained it to me like a dozen times and my brain doesn't retain it. <laughs> um, I don't know if he sure. retained it better. Yeah, it's complicated. I think um, the piece that I would add is that, that, you know, what we need in terms of the functionality of the meeting versus what we need for a mass audience versus what we need for interaction with the audience have been some different technologies. And as, as we've been very transparent with, we're, we're sort of bootstrapping this stuff at this point. So as we look forward, we'll, we'll do some analysis of what's necessary for the for the best process so that people can participate wherever they are um, fully and therefore what technology and what people do we need to support that so we'll start with focusing on uh, people's participation and our elected officials participation in good government and then we'll we'll make recommendations on what are the both process improvements technology improvements and people investments that might need to be made including looking comprehensively at the full tech stack and seeing if um, we stay with alternate technologies how we can integrate them or if there's 
one comprehensive technology that can meet all of those needs. As you know, there's been a great deal of evolution over the, even the last 16 months in all of these streaming technologies, and this will give us an opportunity to, to compare and, and make a rational decision. But it will take some time to do that well, and in the meantime, we'll make sure that there are enough kind of uh, uh, raw staffing power uh, to support uh, Tony and to support the public works team to do what they need to, to keep this going well. Great. Thanks, Kip. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And obviously, we're not going to figure that out here in this meeting. I just, I, I, you know, I'm certainly an advocate for trying to simplify and consolidate and reduce redundancies as much as possible. And I'm, I'm sure everybody shares that value. So just wanted to to lay that out a little bit. Um, look forward to hearing what you all learn and what you propose, but uh, very excited that we are focused on enabling hybrid meetings for um, all participants in, in their, various, their various ways. So thank you again for all the staff work on this and um, appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Council Member Sparza. Thank you. Um, I. Uh want to echo what my colleague said, uh, Council Member Foley brought up some really good points and questions, so I won't um, repeat those. Um, I did want to just point out that uh, this is more for the city folks, that um, while hybrid meetings have certainly um, made it easier for some folks to participate in meetings that we need to be mindful of, the fact that that the traditional meetings and meetings on Zoom still leave out a lot of folks. And so we shouldn't um, get too comfortable with this one way of doing things that we still need to look for creative ways to solicit input from residents, particularly low income monolingual residents or the folks that are working two or three jobs and not the type of jobs that they can just work from home uh, that makes it more difficult to have their voices heard. So that's the only caveat with that. I also will be uh, supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tony, I had a couple of questions from the memo. Um, and forgive me if this is provided elsewhere, but I was trying to understand what exactly it would cost for the desired uh, upgrades or I, I guess capital replacement here for the system. I don't have that number. Um, Walter might be able to speak to that. Hi, Walter. Thank you, Tony, and good afternoon, Mayor Ricardo and members of the City Council. Walter Lynn, Public Works Deputy Director. We've gone through an analysis in terms of what parts of the old existing system are still in place versus those that we did replace over the last that many years. With that though, the main components that are needed still to be replaced is the main audio system. Um, and there are some elements of the video system as well with the freezing uh, touch screens as uh, unfortunately many have experienced. Uh, from a best case scenario until we can go fully out uh, to bid, uh, we're thinking that uh, for the chambers and the committee rooms, it will be in uh, probably the four to 500,000 range. Uh, that is our best guesstimate at this point until we do go out to, to, to bid and get hard bids in. Okay, that's helpful. Um, that's actually less than I thought, which is encouraging. Um, it seems like something we should be able to make happen in a, in a mid-year. Or... Okay, uh, and then I saw in terms of the transition to hybrid, I saw the addition of two security officers. Could you explain that to me, Tony? Why do we need two additional security staff? I believe the thinking was when we're kind of spread out in the multiple rooms, we'll need additional security um, to handle the the movement. Um, I did talk because I, I worked with with a group of people on this, um, and that was that was a guess. We may not need that, so that's why I said it's the staffing is kind of worst case scenario. Because uh, when we have those overflow meetings, we generally bring in temporary security to help sort of wrangle everybody. Yeah. Okay. That's. They may not be necessary. So it's fairly rare, right? I mean, that's maybe once a. Well, when we're, yeah, when we're not, um, when we're able to seat everybody again and we're not socially distanced, because right now the capacity of the council chambers is very low. Oh, I see. More likely to go overflow. But once we're full capacity and we're planning to keep hybrid, I'm assuming forever, um, then we wouldn't need that those security officers going back and forth because most of the people would be in the chambers. Oh, okay. And then there seems to be intention to try 
I'm, I'm trying to understand the, the community st center strategy. So the idea is that we'd identify a couple community centers or all the community centers. I mean, with, given our limited resources, what's realistic there? Well, um, that just comes out of the memo where you guys suggested looking at community centers and, and could we do this? Yeah. Uh, so right now, when I, I met with PRNS, they were like, we don't have the, the networking capability in the community rooms. I right. have to go out to the community rooms to do redistricting commission meetings. I have to do one in every district. So I'm going to kind of test it out there and see okay. bringing in a portable um, hotspot would would take care of it. So maybe we don't need to re-network a community room. Maybe we just have a portable hotspot. So I'll be working through those issues in August and September. Right. And then okay. we'll identify like maybe, you know, specific ones you guys want. Yeah. I mean, I appreciate this is a pretty heavy lift. And I understand maybe having some community centers that are located in neighborhoods where um, we know a lot of residents can't afford connectivity. Obviously, we're trying to change that, and we're working very hard to do that. But we think there's some significant financial barriers. Make some sense. I just think that we could be doing this in a lot of parts of the city, and, and nobody's going to show up. And I'm not sure it'll be worth the, all the energy and effort. Um, okay, thank you for that, Tony. Uh, Councilmember Ress. Actually, that's exactly what I was going to ask about the community centers and, and uh, the efforts that were going to take place there. Um, I do uh, think that it could work this very different way of engaging our families. I think you heard from our speakers that they feel empowered in a way that they hadn't before, um, where maybe City Hall was inaccessible or just because of childcare and in between school and sports. They just can't make a council meeting. And so I'm really looking forward to this, this hybrid um, uh, portion of, of our, our council meetings. Um, and I think when we, um, when we choose our council, I mean, when we choose our community centers, I'm hoping that we can make sure that they're in places where people, where it's difficult uh, for folks to access, um, have low um, access to the internet. Um, and I think we have some of those identified areas already through our library department. Um, but I also wanted to um, remind everybody that we do have community Wi-Fi around James Slick and Overfelt and Yedra Buena. And so that's another opportunity for families to participate. Um, um, but I think there's another piece of this that, that needs some encouragement and that could be um, just an explanation of what council meetings are, really breaking them down and breaking down some of that agenda for our folks who come in uh, to use a community center. It, it wouldn't be the worst thing that we um, televised at our community centers if we had an, a, a live version of our council meetings uh, as people are coming in to register their kiddos uh, for classes that they get a glimpse of what we're doing and maybe um, an interest and in, we spark an interest um, in folks uh, and, and just kind of showing um, people uh, providing some technical assistance in terms of how do you log on, how do you get to YouTube. Uh, I heard from, from some of the school districts that even though I think there's been um, a huge advance in um, providing access to a lot of families, there's still a lot of technical assistance a lot of hand holding, um, certainly for families, um, so that they can get to where we want them to go in terms of online. So um, there might be there might be that need in the future, Tony. Um, I'm just really excited to take our show on the road because um, I see this uh, as an opportunity for us to expand um, and really uh, engage our community in a way we hadn't before. Thank you. Uh, Kip? 
Yeah, so just want to skip a beat back and, and clarify the, the guidance, of course, has been changing so quickly on uh, capacity that on uh, the need for the overflow, we'll probably not have that. We think we can be going back into council at capacity now. And this is these are the, the clarity that's only come in the last couple of days here. So it's, a, it's a, after the memo was written and put forward. So in terms of the uh, Council capacity we will probably have the ability to accommodate most every single meeting within council chambers you know, with the new guidance that we're getting on the health side, though occasionally we, we would still need the overflow. So that might reduce the need for that security piece um, and simplify some of the other operations because we wouldn't have to have a parallel audio visual set up in multiple rooms. So hopefully that will stay the case and, and simplify both the cost and the technological complexity on most of that. Thanks, Kip. Yeah, I really agree. It, operating in multiple rooms is really challenging. So thank you. Okay, any other comments? We have a motion, I believe, from Councilmember Foley. So let's vote on that. Menes? Yes. Alice? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Han? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, thank you. Item 3.5 is compensation and benefit changes for executive management and professional employees of Unit 99 and other unrepresented employees. I don't believe there's a presentation here. Let's go to the public for any comments on this item 3.5 compensation and benefit for employees in Unit 99. Tessa? Thank you. Tessa Woodman C, thank you so much. Uh, I guess the thing about employees, I know that they've been protesting that they want a higher raise. And um, and I understand their, their concerns and the good work that they have done um, that has left them vulnerable in regards to uh, COVID-19. And, and they want a comparable to our police uh, which got 7% versus their 3%. But the only thing I want to say is that I haven't, you know, it's been so poor, the the outreach during COVID to my council members. They don't call back. And, and on top of it, the way the staff, that they couldn't figure out how to get it, their, their communication directly to their cell phone, like every, every other corporation was able to figure out. You know, everybody, are you working at home? Yeah, I'm working at home. You know, yet we get, Oh, sorry, we're working home. We'll get back to you soon, is what I get from Deb Davis's office. No one ever gets back to us. So I don't know. Thank you. Uh, the person, oh, Blair, welcome. Hi, thanks. Uh, in reading this, uh, boy, I mean, uh, there was so much effort to really talk about uh, city staff, city government getting a bit of a pay raise. I would think we could be considering how to lower the pay raise in the 2021 contract of the SJPOA a bit, you know, just a tiny bit, lower it a bit, raise the uh, city staff uh, pensions and, and plans a bit, and that and can balance itself out. And I think it's a sacrifice the SGP, SJPD should be willing to make. I mean, I, I'm i just a bit flabbergasted and uh, the, the police department, uh, is, they're crying like little children for the demand, and I'm not happy about that. Thank you. Thank you. Person with the phone number 5140. Yeah, you better believe that the employees aren't happy when the police and fire department are making so much money and they cry, cry, cry for, you know, SJPD, what, you know, a guy's a captain, he's making half a million dollars a year. You know, you know what I've got for, for the people at SJPD and the fire department? I got the world's smallest violin for them. You know, and we get to pay, what, 80, 90% of their salary when they retire? You want to talk about glorified welfare, SJPD, i.e. San Jose pot dealers, right? And San Jose fire, can't put out a fire department, right? They make all this money. What do they do? The other city people, I mean, I guess you know what you guys need to do? Cut code enforcement while you're at it. Cut parking enforcement while you're at it. It's a bunch of fascists in khakis driving around a Prius, right? So cut those guys. 
cut the fire department and cut the police force. They don't do anything. They don't do anything. I mean, I, I imagine that the police department is going to be confiscating the guns I'm for Sam I'm in the future. This I've got to see. All right, thank you. Melanie? Hi, this is Melanie Helmke, and I am calling regarding the contract for the city employees. And I know that um, we're being told that you guys are unwavering on what you're offering, and I I just feel that that is completely unfair. You guys are sitting there in your office doing quite well living in San Jose while we are struggling to make ends meet yet being completely loyal to our jobs here with the city. We're not asking for a huge pay raise. We're not asking to meet what you're giving the officers. We are asking for equal and fair treatment for the jobs that we do. I'd like to invite you to come to my job and see exactly what I do and then look me in the face and tell me that I don't deserve a decent cost of living raise. I just don't see that you're listening to what we're trying to tell you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's return to council. Can't remember, I don't believe there's a motion on this. Sure. Move approval. Thank you. All right, motion from council member, is that Sparza, I believe? Okay, second from vice mayor, let's vote. Menes. Aye. Perales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Costco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Uh, on to items 3.6 and 3.7. Uh, we're gonna hear these two items together. These are public hearings on the Downtown Business Improvement District budget report and assessments and the Japantown Business Improvement District budget report and assessments for the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, and uh, these public hearings um, also involve the levy of the assessments, of course, for the upcoming year. Before I open the public hearings, the city clerk received any written protests from affected businesses in either of these business improvement districts. Uh, no written protests have been received from the business improvement districts. Okay. This time, then, we will open the public hearing uh, and we'll receive comments specifically on these two items, 3.6 and 3.7, on the business improvement districts downtown in Japantown, Kessa. Well, hello. Yeah, let me see. Did it come on? Oh, do you hear me? Oh, here it is. There you go. Oh, good. Thank you so much, uh, Tessa Woodman C. And I guess I know that these business districts, you know, they all pay in to do their benefits. I know Willow Glen has had that type of thing, and the Alameda try to get that type of thing. We didn't pass. But the issue that I'm I'm um, addressing in terms of downtown assessment, you know, that we really need to change the way downtown is. It needs to be car free. At least Santa Clara. We, I mean, the Santa Clara could be a much better street if it was no cars. And like I've been saying, like Santa Barbara, that um, we, you know, they they shut it down. And, and, and a lot of cities, even like Palo Alto and Mountain View are really reconsidering, you know, how not opening it back up. And it has been such a boom for the economy. So all those myths about that, if we don't have the cars, that the businesses will fail, um, that, you know, so I think we need leadership in terms of, you know, the way these downtown, our downtown is being run in terms of our city and in terms of climate change. So that. Thank you. Blair. Hi, thank you for, very much for the words of Tessa. Um, I'm concerned uh, this downtown issues kind of made CED meeting yesterday. Uh, good luck on what you do. Um, the uh, east side has been decimated by COVID, basically, uh, and, and how you work with small businesses, the small business loan process that can also be offered at the county level. Uh, good luck in that efforts that can work downtown very well. Um, 
uh, like I said before, I'm learning that uh, ultraviolet light in the air filtration systems can be a really good vaccine process. Uh, good luck in those efforts. And can you give a report back soon on what the crime is in the downtown area? You put a lot more police foot patrol there. How is that process going? You have, you know, a ton of big bellies downtown. I've never liked them. Can you have open public policy so I can understand what, what technology is in those big bellies? And can Okay, uh, the person with the phone number ending 5140. Person with the phone number 5140, your phone is muted. All right, Paul Soto. Uh, yeah, Paul Soto. Uh, I noticed something that the downtown businesses got received just as much money as the regular public, just the regular population. You know, just just downtown alone. And so, um, the advocacy of Scott Meese and 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 Jeff Ariaga and Gary Dillable and Eric Hayden and all these chess pieces that are moving in place to create this ecosystem that doesn't have people like me in mind. And though that's the conversation that we, we, we kind of have to have because the amount of power that those men are leveraging in the city because it belongs to them. They spent $300 million in 90 days and think that they're not leveraging power to get money funneled over there as a result of Thank you. Okay, returning to council, I want to thank the uh, many businesses uh, that contribute to these business improvement districts. I think contrary to the suggestion that was made in public comment, we're actually not giving the businesses any money. They're giving money to support a business improvement district that really performs public functions, uh, cleaning, beautifying these business districts. And I'm grateful uh, that businesses are willing to contribute. Uh, we formed, I know, the Second of these actually, well, I know these have been formed at different years, but uh, they ultimately require the assent of the businesses to create. So I'm grateful that uh, they are willing to do so. We are now closing the public hearing um, and we will consider any public, I'm sorry, any council comment? I'll, I'll move approval. Okay. Second. Motion for council member Paul, second council member Davis. Um, since I see Tamiko Rast, I just want to say thank you, Tamiko, for all your work in Japan Town. Thank you, Sal, for your work with small businesses as well. All right, uh, let's vote on the motion. Yes. Yes. Carlos? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Garza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Holly? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Okay, so uh, the council has now considered the adoption of the resolutions approving the budget reports for the business improvement districts for the next fiscal year and levying assessments for the business improvement districts for fiscal year 21-22. All right. Uh, did I, uh, Tony, I know I jumped ahead there. Uh, any concerns about the language? I don't think so. I think we just want to note that it, um, for the record, that the motion passed unanimously. Right. Okay. Thank you. That was unanimous. Thanks, everybody. All right. We'll move on then. Uh, item uh, 3.8 San Jose Hotel Business Improvement District Annual Report for Fiscal Year 21-22. And thank you to our hotels who provide these dollars to help us with uh, various endeavors, particularly within the convention center. Tessa? Yes, um, the hotel dollars I consider, um, uh, you know, essentially evil, immoral, uh, selfish and greedy because, you know, we have to start going to zero our fossil fuel use 
And to say that, oh, we're so happy to have hotels and we've been actually, even in our general plan, support hotels is wrong. You know, we need to, we have a climate emergency and you're not acting like it's true because in, in your policies and your land use. And so when we are supporting hotel uh, hotels because they give us money for, you know, whatever they're doing, just like our card rooms, we have to start going to zero. And what that really means is no driving, no flying, no movement of goods. That's when we have to start learning to grow food locally because there won't be the 18 wheeler bringing the food into Whole Foods. And so this, these are the changes we need to make. And we're not doing that. We're not becoming resilient. And we're- Thank you. Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman. I hope my words can be appropriate for this item. There is about there used to be about eight hotels, uh, very you know uh, high class hotels around the first and Gish area, and they've been slowly been dwindling down to about four uh, that are now uh, the other four have been converted to uh, uh, low income uh, affordable housing uh, or short term housing. And um, with the issues of the May events with the VTA. There's no longer any light rail or bus bridge service down First Street at all. And, and while all the other light rail stops can have bus connections, along First Street, there's no, really no bus stops. There's no bus connections, no bus transit. I think we really have to work on this issue and, and offer some sort of shuttle service for the First Street area. And I hope we really work on that. It's hurtful that we're not. Uh, good luck in your efforts. We can grieve, but let's practice our good. Paul Soto. Uh, yeah, thank you. Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, I'd like to know what the status is of if this has any relationship to SVO coming to these meetings and stating that they would file a lawsuit if they were forced to hire back the the uh, Latinos that lost their jobs during COVID, that they came here and they accepted all that COVID money, they accepted all the benefits, and then they had the audacity to come to this council meeting and state that they would file a lawsuit if they didn't hire, if they were forced to hire back uh, the Latinos. And see, this is that right there. That is the part of the exploitation that is sickening to me. And and we go up in these hotel rooms, and it's nothing but paisas, nothing but Latinos. I get sick of that. I get sick and tired of seeing that kind of labor and that kind of exploitation. Turning to the council. Mayor, I'll, uh, I'll move approval and just state that it, it, it uh, similar to the last item. Uh, this is a self-assessment uh, administered, and it, it does not have um, any real, uh, anything in relation to, to what was just stated. Second. 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 All right, motion and second. Let's vote. Anes? Anes? Morales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Reynas? Yes. Holy? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Going back to Jimenez? Yes. Thank you. All right, item uh, 3.9 are actions related to the agreements between the city and Eastside Union High School District for Community Wireless Network. We do have a presentation. I see Jill and Ann and Kip, welcome. Good afternoon, Mayor Licardo and City Council members. I'm Jill Bourne, City Librarian, and I'm here with Ann Grabowski, who is the Chief of Staff for the Library. Um, but you know us also as the Director and Assistant Director of the EOC Digital Inclusion Branch and the Digital Equity City Priority Team. So we're very pleased to be here today to seek your approval on the funding agreement with the Eastside Union High School District to facilitate a critical final build-out phase of the Access Eastside Community Wi-Fi project. As you know, this is in alignment with the digital inclusion um, expenditure plan, excuse me, that was unanimously approved by City Council in June 2020. 
When completed, this network will provide Wi-Fi coverage to more than 300,000 residents in the attendance areas of the eight Eastside high schools in the district. To get into the requested action today, I'm gonna to turn it over to Anne. Thanks, Jill. As Jill just mentioned, um, this action follows on the June 23rd, 2020 council approval of our expenditure plan for the digital inclusion um, priority work. This action today authorizes the city manager's office to enter into contracts with Eastside Union High School District City Center SmartWave. The framework below or on the slide um, outlines which entity pays for which costs based on the different attendance areas. So for existing attendance areas already in operation, the district pays for design and construction, is paying for maintenance, and will pay for a technology refresh in each area. For areas that were accelerated and funded in June 2020, the city is paying for design and construction, and the district will pay for maintenance and a technology refresh. For future areas, the district will pay for all of the previously mentioned costs except that the city and the district will split the cost of a necessary fiber installation to the Mount Pleasant area 50-50. Just quickly, this table provides an update on our project area schedules. We expect that the three attendance areas that are in development will be completed in the first half of 2022. If approved today, we'll, we'll move expediently to schedule the fiber pole to Mount Pleasant and move the remaining two areas into the design phase. Go back to Jill. Oh, Jill, you're on mute. Got it. As we wrap up, I wanted to acknowledge the digital equity team, especially Regine Nair, who was the original sponsor of this project, and Ann Grabowski, who has taken it on and facilitated this latest stage in partnership with all the city departments that you see on this slide. I also want to acknowledge the consultants who are doing this work, SmartWave, Studio 151, and Infinity Communications. And finally, I want to express our thanks and appreciation to the Eastside Union High School District leadership, particularly former superintendent Chris Funk, current superintendent Glenn Vanderzee, technology guru Randy Phelps, and the Board of Trustees, especially Board President Lorraine Machadas, for their support, partnership, patience, advocacy, and tenacity. And we are all very excited for this project to move forward and welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Agreed and bravo. Uh, let's go to the public for a comment. We'll come back to the council. Uh, first, Tessa, we're commenting on 3.9, which is the agreements between the city and Eastside Union High School District Community Wireless. Thank you so much, um, Mayor Licardo going over it i guess did you put it on your oh you even put it on your screen oh look at you you're doing a good job thank you for having it up there and um yeah so basically you know the digitalization of our of our world is, is so much helpful in regards to climate change that we can stay home and i think that um one of the things that came up in the news with the san jose unify that they were stopping some of their um uh, uh homeschooling programs and I know that the city doesn't have direct control over the school districts, but you know, just in, you know, I appreciate what you're doing in terms of the digitization of our uh, classrooms and our homes, and, and that's so important. Especially, you know, we were talking about in, in, even in terms of participating in our democracy, but that I think we we need to um, ha use our technology to to. Um, we create those connections without burning fossil fuels and having to go th places like we see with what happens with our schools full of cars and we need thank you Blair all right thank you Blair Beekman Tessa just very nicely said you know ways to be participating in our democracy this is bridging our digital divide I can't stress enough the ideas of open public policy to go along with the four and 5G and bridging the digital divide, that's incredibly important for our future democracy. And, and, and it can teach high school kids how to practice better practices of open public policy and, and, and community democracy. Paul very nicely offered in consent calendar about Vision Zero and the needs of equity for the future of Vision Zero. Open public policies work towards those equity ideas. And there, it's, there's nothing but a win-win situation by practicing you know, better open public policies with the future of 
uh, digital divide issues. Uh, the two should work hand in hand. Uh, the Charter Commission is working on these sort of questions right now. Think of what open pol public policy talks about for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Soto. Uh, yeah, this was a, what happened on the east side is a prime example of institutionalized racism. It's a prime example. It is the lack of attention and resources in areas that have historically been neglected for at least a hundred years, a hundred years in this city. Okay. These kids experience two criminogenic factors. And I know you know what a criminogenic factor is, Ricardo. Now, number one, they lack at least two grades. They need to be tested so that we can form a baseline of where they're at. That's number one. Number two is intellectually and socially they're disconnected from the kids. We're not going to see the impact of the residual effects of what happened here for probably another 10 years. Oh, but it's going to be there. And so these, the, what happens with these kids, this generation right here, it needs to be documented now because we are responsible for what happens. All right, thank you. Uh, just wanted to say thanks to the entire team for all the great work and really uh, thrilled to hear that we're gonna have a three additional attendance areas up and running in 2022. That's gonna be a fantastic benefit for a lot of families. Uh, Councilmember Arenas. Completely agree, Mayor. Um, we knew uh, pre-pandemic that we were facing a digital divide and uh, your office took um, a strong leadership, Mayor, uh, in moving us all along. And I think um, this crisis created an opportunity for us to really expedite um, and put not only um, devices in the hands of our children, but also the, the opportunity to connect. Um, and Access East Side is definitely one of the ways that we connected aside from the hotspots. And, um, and one of the things that, that I um, think about um, in terms of what we've done this last year is allowed for folks to connect to not only school, but um, to doctors, to appointments, to jobs, future opportunities, um, and really most importantly to each other. This is how we are all connecting right now. Um, and so I'm, I'm really grateful that the work that's coming out of our library department, as well as the digital equity um, coalition is, take, is, you know, we're almost across the finish line. I, I say we're like 99% across the finish line in terms of uh, focusing on some of these East Side um, Union High School districts, um, high schools. And, um, and as I think we didn't see it in, in this presentation, but I know that my team had received some information and some of the uh, unduplicated user um, uh, data would really impress all of you. I think for April, 2021, um, around the Overfelt area, we had 34,000 unduplicated users. 34,000, I don't, I, you know, I don't know I, uh, how, how we get that many, um, but there has been a bit of a decrease. And I think one of the, um, one of the concerns I have is that potentially some of our families don't understand what, what this community Wi-Fi is. Um, you know, when we go to a, um, a, a community area or a common area around Starbucks or, um, any any store usually has their um, Wi-Fi, and we're kind of used to that, right? We're kind of used to popping onto a Wi-Fi um, band when we um, connect to any of those establishments. But I don't know that it's um, common um, information that we have these wonderful connections now, at least in Overfelt, Yerba Buena, and James Lick, and so. Um, one of the reasons I wrote this memo is because I wanted to make sure that our families continue to understand that even though we had 34,000 um, unduplicated users, I wanted, and, and because that number has fallen a little bit, I wanted us to continue to you to promote this great work that you were, have all completed and, and accomplished. Um, 
and just inform people, hey, this is a safe way to get on to um, the internet in case, you know, you may not have a hotspot for your kiddo or for whatever reason, it, you know, it's not functioning that day. This is another way of, of getting online. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why I wrote the memo. Um, the other uh, reason is that for those folks who continue to be, um, and I'll be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm also a, a paper person. <laughs> Um, I like seeing something in front of me. I like putting something on the fridge. Um, I know Jill, you, you, I saw your papers too. I, I'm, you know, I'm old school <laughs> and, and, um, and I think a lot of our families are too. And so one of the things I think would be really helpful is for us to, to maybe distribute some printed material that could help people, um, especially those who are not so familiar with a community Wi-Fi or just a Wi-Fi in general, just to let them know these are the steps, one, two, three, this is how you get in um, and, and it's safe and, um, and you can use this on any tablet or device. Um, um, and aside from that, I think to take it one step further, maybe for those folks that's, that's just good enough, they post that on their, on their fridge, that reminds them of what the steps that they need to take. But then there's folks who are a little more resistant or may, need a little bit more hand-holding. And one of my suggestions on the memo is for us to actually have some technical assistance, maybe align our CETF um, grantees and the work that is being done in that area so that we can provide some technical assistance, maybe some in-person workshops in some of our um, really hot spots, maybe some of the hot spots that have uh, that we've seen a decline around. Um, you know, you you've all been really good measures of um, of equity, and I, I know that you've been good stewards of, of of equity. I've seen it in in the independence project where. Um, not every, uh, I think not every area around Independence High School was going to have access to that community Wi-Fi and you made sure to align that design closer so that you could have that high need area. So there's a lot of technical um, uh, work that you and your staff have done. Um, I know that uh, Nora in our city attorney's office has done a lot of really great work, a lot of just, uh, technical information, a lot of legal information, and Anne and um, and Rajani have been just doing some really great work out there. So um, th thank you, Anne. I think I see you uh, there. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to one to let the the public know a little bit about some of the work that you've all been doing um, that we don't get to see, that we get to hear about. Um, some of the challenges that we face. Uh, it, it's not so easy just to plug and unplug like most of us who that's ultimately a, my default solution for anything is just plug it and unplug it it'll work <laughs> but you've done so much work around the fiber pool around mount pleasant just finding some technical solutions and i really appreciate that and i know my community will too um, once we get online um, and even in between um, just having our hot spots in some of those areas have just been really important. So, so thank, uh, thank you, uh, Jill, and thank, please thank your team on my behalf. Thank you, Anne and Rajani and, and Nora. Um, this is just really excellent work and my memo is just asking for us to continue with this excellent work um, and for us to, and I know that you're, you're going to keep this in mind anyway, but it keep, make sure that we have Mount Pleasant and that we have Silver Creek really close behind. Uh, I know you've been able to work some of these technical issues in the past um, where we have our contractors working simultaneously in parallel so that it, there isn't any real lag um, for any of our schools. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. And I just wanted to move my memo and, uh, and thank you for all the great work that you're doing. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Motion and I don't know who got the second, but a lot of people jumped in. Uh, Council Member Sparza is claiming it. I'll support the motion. Council Member Sparza. Thank you. I just wanted to um, thank uh, everybody involved, thank the Eastside Union High School District and the Eastside voters who sort of kicked this off back when Council Member Carrasco was 
board member at Carrasco. And um, we had the vision to start this several years ago. And I also wanted to give a shout out to my colleagues who during the pandemic, when um, we had school board members from all over the east side and actually all over the city come to us um, with their concerns at how huge and how critical the digital digital divide issue was um, that they all saw this coming and so I wanted to thank my colleagues for standing with them uh, for standing together and investing um, in this program so that we can do the um, the community wireless network um, and expand it and be more aggressive about it and so um, uh, it's huge and, and hearing the numbers um, of, of those using it. I mean, those are the people who would, I mean, think of that tens of thousands of people per, per high school, <laughs> tens of thousands at each would not be able to access the uh, internet if it weren't for this. I mean, it's, it's kind of mind boggling. Um, and that here we're in Silicon Valley and our city is, has been taking extraordinary steps that other cities are just starting to think about. And I'm sure Mayor Licardo put it in the ear of Governor Newsom so that the state could catch up to what San Jose has been doing. Um, and so, and thank you to Jill and Kip, and I don't know if Randy's on the phone or if um, Superintendent Vanderzee is on, but. Um, I'd really like to thank them for their dedication. Um, I had a really quick question regarding the community survey that staff um, mentioned had not received a lot of responses. How did we push that out before and what are we doing differently this time other than follow Council Member Arenas' memo? Thank you, Council Member. Um, in the spring, staff prepared a survey and sent it out through distribution channels of, we really wanted to target the locations that had existing Wi-Fi so that we could avoid extemporaneous and extraneous um, survey responses that might skew our data. So we focused on libraries and community centers in the areas where the three networks were operational, as well as the schools um, that were in those specific areas. We didn't reach out to CBOs at the time because so much of their population exists outside of their geographic area, and so many are not geographically specific. Um, we received about 400 responses, and it happened that many of them somehow got the survey and they didn't live in the area. And so the data was skewed, which is why we're going out again, and also in hopes to get a, a larger sample size. As we go back out, we're going to do a, a stronger push with um, our schools because we found out that many of them did actually didn't distribute the survey. Um, it was a busy time for schools as they were all coming back in person and families were pretty exhausted. So we're picking a fresh time to do the survey when hopefully people have less survey fatigue. We are pushing heavily through the schools because we know that they are our biggest users since the students have, many of the students have Eastside um, Union High School District credentials and use the student network. And then we are going to do a better job locating nonprofit providers in the area that are providing in-person services. And now that more people are doing things in person, we think that that distribution method will help. Um, also, libraries are back in person. We'll have an easier time um, getting people where they are in, in the area. And we're absolutely open to more feedback. We'd love for the council members to push it out when it's available as well. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And, um, so on the, school, on the schools, and I also forgot to thank the feeder school districts who voted to, um, to help finance the maintenance of this. So um, it's pretty extraordinary to see the buy-in that, um, that everyone has given to this acknowledging the incredible need. Um, so have you worked with the feeder schools as well or just the high schools? We have worked with the feeder schools as well. Uh -huh. So okay, uh, I should also... Curious. Oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say that's curious because, for example, at YB, there's quite a bit of schools there um, right on that stretch. So uh, I guess on the next round, I extend myself. I'm sure my colleagues will um, be happy to um, play a, a role in helping out um, on the next survey. And um, I think Councilmember Arenas, you know, mentioning 
utilizing council offices project hope right is huge mm -hmm. um and uh the grantees that's to your point with the cbo's but those grantees are often um working with families in those locations so happy to pitch in and we'll be happy to support the motion thank you absolutely thank you and i should also mention to the council as part of the answer to your question that we are um, the city will be considering adding digital equity as an sj311 service which would allow people to hopefully geolocate where they are in relation to a, a free community wi-fi network and then also provide us live feedback um, of how that network is operating because i think that's the question that we need to answer is what is their user experience and are they relying on it um, so we know that people are using the network based on the data that we have and we think that most people are having an okay time and so our next push is to get more data from people that that validates that they're doing that it's working and reliable for them and then make changes appropriately where where we see there to be issues yeah, and I think we'll get some more data. For example, Franklin McKinley is has been offering a lot of um, parent classes so that parents can learn the technology with the children, or actually the children are probably teaching the parents. Um, but uh, but their uh, folks are, are being given a project for the summer uh, so that they can then contribute that and you know practice and use all the stuff over the summer. So they'll they'll be on devices throughout the summer so that might be another opportunity thanks thank you council member Khan. yeah thanks I, I just wanted to thank staff for bringing this forward and continuing to work on this important topic uh council member as far as i mentioned the advocacy that was done last year i was part of the digital equity coalition on the other side of things as a school board member last year that came before the council to advocate for this uh this funding in this project um, and also a school board member who voted as a member of the feeder district to help fund it. So I'm excited that we are funding, uh, you know, Berryessa will be, the school district will be funding the portion of the Independence High School um, attendance area that is in, in Berryessa in District 4. Um, and I'm excited to see this project getting closer to being finished. It's really important for our families. So I just wanted to thank everyone and um, I will definitely be supporting the motion. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to put a little bit of the work in perspective. Um, if all goes well in these next three deployments, uh, we will have connected uh, more than 300,000 residents with community Wi-Fi, and that's equivalent to a city the size of St. Louis, Pittsburgh, or Cincinnati. Uh, it's a tremendous accomplishment in a very short period of time. And so I just want to say thank you to our partners, the Eastside Union uh, High School District, for their uh, for their leadership many years ago, Chris and everybody getting that e-bond out there. Thank you to everybody in the city team uh, for really pushing forward. I know it's been uh, particularly challenging and particularly important in the last year, year and a half. And so thank you everybody. Uh, thanks to SmartWave as well and, and all of our private sector partners. Um, I did have some questions, Jill. I know we've had a lot of conversation offline about the issue around the quality of the connection. And it's so important now because we know I mean, the, the residents we're serving are living in, in housing that's overcrowded. We've got a lot of kids who might be students who need to use um, the connection at the same time you may have uh, many, many adults as well. Uh, and so the broadband speeds are really critical. And we know even the standard definition of broadband, the 25 down, three up, is not adequate for many of the families we're serving. So I, I've heard anecdotal information that in some places we've got some spotty connections and I know that there's some effort that's being made. Could you tell us just a little bit about how we're gonna get out there and really try to understand where we need to patch um, those places that need better connectivity perhaps with boosters. Um, and you know, I, I believe we've set aside some resources for that in the fall. Could you just tell us a little bit about the plan yeah, thank you, Ms. Mayor. And I, I think that it, it actually also um, relates to the uh, supplemental memo from uh, Councilmember Arenas in that uh, part of the plan this fall or, or leading up to the fall is that, you know, additional engagement with the families in, that live in this area is really important so that we can really understand, as Anne said, what their experience is. And is it a dropped connection? Are we, are we having challenges in certain neighborhoods? Because that feedback has, has been what's allowed us to make sort of surgical improvements 
in specific, I mean, it can literally be as specific as one block that, that doesn't have enough, you know, antennas on the poles or whatever the right. correct technology term is. So to that point, we have- Wi-Fi um, juice is what I call yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. We have put aside funding in the next um, funding package that council approved for the digital equity work to, um, to basically augment the networks that are being built. So this um, building this feedback loop, marketing out the, the programs through our providers and our partners is gonna be so important. Providing support, uh, tech support, because sometimes it's user error. I know it is in my house a lot of times, but sometimes it's the network. So we need to understand you know, wh where those holes are in the network essentially. And, and we do have funding available to go in and make those um, surgical fixes. Um, there, was an, there was some feedback that we got from a partner um, through you, I believe, and that's when you and I had the first conversation. And I know that we did identify what the issue was. And I, I know, right. Anne, you had done some work on that. So if you want more information about that, we can provide it. Um, but that's kind of the process we're in is we need right. that feedback so that we can continue to improve on the network. Okay. And in addition to the sort of the reactor feedback, because I know sometimes, you know, people don't complain if they don't know who to complain to and that kind of thing. We're going to have folks out there, you know, testing internet speeds uh, on their, on their phones just to determine where we're getting good connections, where we're not. Uh, and do you want to speak to that, how they're, the consultants are managing or assessing the network? how it's working. Sure, and Rob, jump in um, if I go awry since I work at the library. Um, but my the, the path that we've set forward is to build a tool that can digest all the technical information coming from the infrastructure on number of users, data, speeds, et cetera. Um, and also marry that with the qualitative feedback that we're getting from residents in a way that would allow us to geolocate and target you know, hotspot problem areas and then isolate down to actual technical infrastructure that needs to change um, and or opposite that where we have infrastructure that is working but people are not using it. And so that dashboard tool should be up and running um, towards the end of summer that we'll be able to um, bring into our fall report. Thanks, Ann. I know you didn't mean to suggest that working for the library and tells you to go to Rye, because we know that doesn't happen. Um, the, yeah. uh, Rob, did you want to jump in? I'm not the IT director, though. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she doesn't work at the library. She works at the library. Um, so, <laughs> but um, yeah, there's a blend of three things. One is the network performance data we have, and that's the data you see in the memo. Um, and we see, for example, the amount of data that's used in Overfelt is, is much, much higher um, yeah. than Yerba Buena. And, and so those fluctuations. Uh, and uh, is completely right, though, is the user experience is the, the most telling of all the data, and that's what we struggle to get to. So the third component is um, reviving that speed up San Jose type tool where people can uh, report and then we can marry those three things and see what types of people uh, issues people might be having. So then we can identify the where and what solutions would help the most. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, last question. Uh, I know we're, we're riding this Wi-Fi horse because this is the horse we have to ride. Um, I know we'd like to make a transition. I, I'm guessing it's to a 4G or 5G world. Um, and do we have any sense of how many years that is out there and how likely we are able to make that transition with a within a reasonable budget <laughs> for community Wi-Fi? Yeah, I, I would say technology changes very fast on this, and we are in conversations right now with some of our partners around what uh, what longer term sustainable solutions might be. Um, then the good news on this is we've got a good five years of good solid technology on this, and if it's still the right technology or the next generation is the right technology, we have the ability to do the refresh. So I think this gives us a really good uh, t time path on this technology and allows us to fully explore the other options in parallel with, with, uh, with the kind of the best of both worlds if we're lucky. Yeah, okay, great, great news. All right, well, thanks everybody. Uh, you should know your work is absolutely getting national attention where uh, I was just speaking at a forum, I guess it was last week and uh, the FCC uh, chair, uh, Commissioner Rosen Marshall, others uh, noted our, our work and, and really appreciate uh, how, how you collectively are really uh, helping to, to, to demonstrate to other cities what, what's possible uh, for 
overcoming this decisional divide and, and really promoting equity in our community. So thank you all for the, for the work you're doing. Okay, we are, we have a motion from Council Member Reynes. Let's vote. Reynes. Prowess. Yes, on Jimenez. Thank you. Yes. Prowess. Yes. Thank you. Cohen. Aye. Roscoe. Aye. Davis. Yes. Urza. Yes. Reynes. Yes. Foley. Aye. Mahan. Aye. Jones. Aye. Ricardo. Aye. All right. Um, just checking with the time. I know that we have a time certain, I believe it's 6.30 for, for item 4.1. It's now five o'clock. So I'm gonna plow through and we'll take a break at 5.30 for dinner. Hopefully that's all right with everyone. And uh, in case that's a challenge, just raise your hand. Uh, otherwise we'll go on to item 3.10, which are merit increases and additional executive leave for council appointees. Uh, we'll go first to the public. Again, item 3.10, um, merit increases and additional leave for council appointees, Tessa. Okay, yeah, well, I, I know the appointees that you were looking at is um, our city, our general, um, what is it called, our city manager. And I know they get paid a lot, but I haven't been happy with the city manager in regards to response. Like they don't, they don't call back. They don't respond to anything. And we're even looking at, as we, you know, try to decide if we have a strong mayor or a strong manager, you know, we have problems with both those departments. So I can't really say which one is better. The, the mayor's office too, doesn't respond to, to your responses, doesn't answer the phone. Like I called San Francisco once and they answered the phone city um, mayor's office. It was like, oh, that's nice. We don't get that in the city of San Jose. It's like, it's a mailbox and nobody returns your calls. And that's how our mayor's office runs. And then the city manager's office is similar. They don't respond back. So I think we need a lot of improvements in our, the way our city um, responds back to the public. And, you know, basically a, a more. Thank you, Blair. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to compliment the uh, final public comment from a couple items back of uh, the woman who asked about, uh, you know, city city government, city staff uh, wage increase issues and that, that you guys can't uh, work towards that is a bit exasperating and surprising and something that uh, the city's manager's office, I think uh, normally has better control over. And I really hope that uh, I really honestly feel that, uh, you know, the police union should realize the, the space we're in, they're being given a huge new complex. Uh, they, they, they have a lot of uh, benefits already going on. Uh, they need to really, we all need to learn to uh, reassess the situation and that can be okay. I can understand, uh, you know, initial decisions made. Let's review that, that what's been uh, offered at this time. And to uh, quickly conclude, uh, try to work towards a more clear notification process for the future placement of four and five. Thank you. Uh, person with the phone number 5140. Yeah, it's not often I agree with Tessa, but she's about a million percent true about trying to get a hold of anybody at the city of San Jose. I didn't know there were so many kings and queens out there that uh, are too good to deal with the public, uh, you know, uh, city, the city council, forget it, never get back to you, never email back to you. Really lazy, lazy, lazy. San Jose Police Department, try calling them. You get the same recording, any phone number that you call. I've been trying to meet with the police captain that is in charge of uh, Southern Division, cannot get a hold of them, cannot get through, cannot leave a voicemail message. The only person who picked up the other day was a guy at the Rose Garden. Well, not the Rose Garden. The guy who's in charge of fixing the light poles. There's a there's a damaged light pole. Hey, Deb Davis, are you listening? There's a damaged light. All right, returning to the council. Is there a motion? I'll try again. Is there a motion or a oh, comment? approval? Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Menes, for jumping in. Uh, let's vote. 
Jimenez? Yes. Corrales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Paco? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. All right, uh, item 3.11 is city auditor appointment, uh, merit increases in additional executive league, uh, amending city San Jose pay plan. We are reappointing Joe Royce. Congratulations, Joe, and thank you for your service. Uh, we will take comments from the public on 3.11 regarding the city auditor appointment. Tessa. Okay, the city auditor. Uh, you know, how we're spending our money. And I, I really think that we need to have a uh, centralized way of dealing with problems within our city, like other cities have, like New York City. When you call the 311, um, they give you a case number and you, they follow, you can follow through. You can go online to see the status of what's happening. And that's where um, actually um, Governor Newsom uh, when he went to New York, saw that program and he implemented that in San Francisco. And I know the city of San Jose is working on their 311 program, but as far as I can see, it really doesn't work well. And, you know, when we, especially if you have complicated issues um, that, you know, they need to be addressed. And, you know, I think that they, they need to, we need to have a system that can even deal with the complicated issues. And, um, and so that you don't have to deal with your council members because they never get back to you. And even, you know, Department of Transportation or things like that, you know, they don't get back either. That's not true. She's Hey, Blair. Hi, thank you. <laughs> to again, quickly offer uh, with uh, good notifications for 4 and 5G, that's part of the open public policy process I was trying to talk about before. Thank you. Uh, for this item, a thank you to uh, you know the work of the city auditor and, uh, and to all the city government staff that in this time of equity and reimagine ideas, you guys all made a really committed, organized effort to work towards uh, good equity and, and, and reimagine ideas that are within the auditing process. That was an awesome idea of, of yourselves and it kept things neat and, and important. You worked on balanced budget ideas in this time of COVID, uh, amazing, thank you. Uh, the city of Oakland has just passed their own important reimagine ideas, but they're not quite committed to the ideas of uh, the auditing process and how that can help the reimagine and equity process. You guys can give them some really good instructions. I wrote a few letters to you about the subject. I hope you guys can connect and we can all work on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Person with the phone number 5140. Uh, yeah, the 311 people who I call are great. Tony Tabor down at uh, City Hall is great. Um, and the people who do the public works are pretty quick, but there's a lot of people that you need to get rid of and sharp, start sharpening so we're, we're your speaking pencil. on the city auditor appointment. Yeah, Sorry they need to audit out. what people are being paid, Sam. It's too much. Like how, how much money are, you, are we going to need in the next 20, 30 years to pay for all these retirements? It's insane. And, you know, everyone else gets to ramble but me. You guys keep cutting me off. I'm going to tell you, when you guys are open for business, I will be down there because then you're going to have to face me. So why don't you just give right, me my two minutes? We're speaking on the city auditor retirement. Why don't you just give me my two minutes? Or uh, reappointment, sir. All right, coming back to council. Second. second. All right, motion and second. Let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Carlos? Yes. Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Lee? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. All right. Uh, 3.12 is the independent police auditor appointment merit increases additional executive lead in amending the city of San Jose pay plan. I want to thank Siobhan Nuri for her leadership and the team's great work over the years and uh, great she's also willing to uh, continue to serve. We'll go to the public to speak specifically on uh, the IPA reappointment and related items. <clears throat> Blair?
Let your device appears to be muted right now. Okay, Tessa. Thank you, Tessa Woodman C on the police auditor. Uh, the only question, I mean, I guess you're giving everybody more time off. That, that's nice and things like that. But um, I, I guess the accountability of the uh, police auditor, I, I think the, the basic issues of our police are so ingrained with the guns that it's very difficult that we're going to have a, a peaceful um, transition in terms of our, you know, what is it called, you know, public safety, that so much of, you know, when just carrying the gun creates such hostility. So we really have to look at that, you know, and reimagine our police. But in terms of the police auditor, um, like when I've had issues with it, with my son, when he was protesting with Donald Trump and the way they were so aggressive to him, you know, I realized they got back to me, they sent me a form letter saying, oh, everything was fine. But I'd like to see, uh, you know, I, you know, the, the videos, I want, I want um, documentation of all the encounters with our police so we can, if we have any problems, we can really look at it. So that's really critical. And that never happened when I was dealing with problems with the police. Paul Sarno? Uh, yes, I appreciate the fact that you're going to keep this uh, uh, them budgeted because it's gonna, be, it's gonna be necessary. A lot of the work that they're gonna be doing because what they're going to be doing, and I'm going to make sure of this, is that SB 1421, that those records start being accessed by the city. It, it just it just has to happen. It's already going on three years now, and it hasn't happened. And so there's been advocacy from the top that they're in full support of it. And so, and, and what that's going to do is that we need officers. We absolutely need them in the city. But what we don't need is officers that are going on Facebook and talking about putting nooses around women's necks, and they don't get nothing. There is, they do that, get away with that with impunity. Okay, that's what needs to be addressed. The good cops, hey, I love them. I love the protection. Blair? Hi, thank you, Blair Beekman. Hopefully we'll be working this time. Um, I wanted to thank our current IPA. She's more by the book than our previous IPAs. Um, with that said, you know, um, we've been, uh, the Measure T uh, is trying to offer, uh, is asking for public outreach at this time. The purpose of, initial purposes of Measure T was, was to have some sort of a community-based oversight towards technology. There's lots of talk about community-based oversight for the future of police and for the future of mental health and for the future of, uh, of disabled issues. Um, I hope there can be a way to, to work Measure T ideas to, you know, what can be better oversight practices. Um, you know, uh, police oversight and technology oversight can work well together. So can uh, uh, homelessness and, and possibly disabled. How do, how do we bring that together to the future of the Measure T public oversight process? Thank you. Thank you. All right, returning to the council. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Uh -oh. Any comments? All right, let's vote. Menes? Yeah. Morales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Holy? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Right. Uh, item uh, 3.13 is the interim uh, city manager compensation. And I want to thank Jennifer McGuire for her willingness to step up into this role and her ongoing leadership in the city. Uh, we'll go first to the public for we'll comment on 2.13 interim city manager compensation. Person with the phone number 5140. Yeah, you didn't let me speak on the last topic, Sam. You, you, you passed over me. 
would you be able to do that? If so would you like to speak on item 3.13, the interim city manager compensation? Yeah, how about none? They don't deserve any because the city is run poorly. How about that? And how about we don't need to give people more vacation to, 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 to audit the city? They need less vacation. Try to call a policeman right now. They're all up in Tahoe or in Maui. These guys need more vacation. They need less. They need less pay. You guys need less of everything. I mean, because the way that you guys do things down there, what I, I want to do. On 3.13, which is interim city manager compensation, sir. Okay. Uh, we'll move on then to Tessa. Well, I, I wanted to thank 5140, whoever he is. And I really think we need to um, say our names. I think that's really important that we do say our names, our full names, Tessa Woodmancy. So I'd like to know 5140's name. But I did agree with him that, um, you know, the compensation is 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 out of line with the performance of your jobs. And I see that with my my Dev Davis counselor member. Um, I, and I and I see it with, you know, the, the like I said, with our um, our, our um, you know, city manager, you know, where they don't respond. And actually, I even called some of the other council members, and I, I think it was Sylvia Arenas or Magdalena Carrasco, or, or uh, one of those, or Ma maybe it was Maya Sparza. They don't even have um, uh, meetings. They didn't have Zoom meetings with their, you know, that I could attend, you know, like Pam Foley has been doing, and, and Deb Davis, to her credit, has been doing that, and we appreciate that. But we need more. Thank you. Uh, Blair? Hi, uh, we're here. Good luck in how you can negotiate uh, with the future of city staff uh, to, to offer a bit higher uh, wages for themselves. Uh, uh, thanks for the words of Tessa on the previous item. Uh, I have known uh, the current, uh, wh who will be the upcoming uh, city manager for almost as long as David Sykes. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy with her work. I'm fairly happy with her work. So it's nice that she'll be doing this work at this time. Uh, I can't stress enough the importance of uh, open public policy with the future of technology. I, I hope we all make the efforts uh, to want to, how can that be better improved for ourselves? How can we leave the era of war and work towards an era of peace and sustainability? Uh, it's good democratic practices that can do that. And I think it will show uh, the world really important lessons and really how to uh, define the future of uh, innovation, basically. So, um, Paul Soto. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I hope that uh, Jennifer's listening. I just wanted to extend my congratulations to her and my gratitude for accepting uh, the role of, of, of a city manager. Um, considering that it was it was via uh, David Sykes' office by which uh, Dr. Stephen Petey came to the uh, came to San Jose. Um, I know he's already paid for because March 17th of last year he was uh, slated to come here, but COVID hit. And so I think if there ever was a time when we uh, want to revisit and, and extend our invitation to. Uh, to uh, Dr. Stephen Petey, it, it's it's absolutely necessary, man. I need I need some help. I need some help. I need some advocacy because Chicano is just like getting just rough shot, you know. So I just want to again uh, congratulate you and uh, and thank you. Thank you. All right, returning to the council. Move approval. Second. 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 Council Member Sparza. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to raise my hand as one of those, um, the, the three uh, Latinas who are apparently interchangeable. I'll be supporting this motion. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll vote on the motion. Menez? Yeah. Morales? Yes. Owen? Aye. Roscoe? Roscoe? Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't sure if you were calling Carenza. Yes, Carrasco's a, an I. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Or am I Councilmember Carrasco? Yes. Arenas? 
Yes. Foley? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ardo? Aye. All right, I'm gonna go off script here because it's 520 and we can get a little more work done, but I'm a little concerned if we go into 4.2, that's not gonna get done in 10 minutes and uh, that'll be eaten into our dinner. So what I wanna suggest is that we take on some of the other items that I think we can do a bit more quickly. 8.1, um, assuming C staff is available for the amendment to the lease for the police vehicle and evidence warehouse. There's no presentation. We'll go to we'll public comment on this one. 8.1 is the amendment to the lease for the police vehicle and evidence warehouse. Tessa? Oh, oh, good. Thank you so much. Yes, um, I, I did want to talk about the police vehicles because I, I think that they shouldn't have any vehicles, actually. They should either be on a bicycle or on, on foot. And I really, what I really don't like are the chases when they start chasing people down and then they start shooting at people. We've had people die. Um, there was a death at, at, at Trader Joe's as the police were shooting at the supposed, you know, criminal who might have stole something or whatever it was, you know, terrible. And then and we lost a manager at the Trader Joe's as they were shooting into it. And, and then the, the, the car chases that have caused deaths. You know, I, I don't think we should be chasing people. And um, I, I think, and, and the damage that it does to our community, the risks that it does to have that kind of chases going on. So yeah, I, I don't think we should be supporting any um, cars that they are driving around in. You know, it's, it's climate change, pollution. Thank you. Uh... Blair? Hi, Blair Beekman here. Um, you know, when I first started this work in 2014, uh, you know, I was, it's the ideas of, uh, you know, good open public policies for the future technology. And uh, I was actually with the drone issues, working on uh, better open public policies for the drone issues, remember that? Um, so now we're at a time to, uh, at, at that time in 2014, uh, there was a lot of issues around, uh, you know, the evidence warehouse and how that, those things uh, get sold in police auctions and the money they make off of that. I don't know how that process has developed uh, too much over the years, but it was, a, it was an issue in 2014 and 15. I hope it's uh, like everything we do, you know, uh, I hope we, we develop better practices from the complaints of the time. And uh, that's important to learn how to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the person with the phone number 5140. Yeah, I like just being a number because that's how it's going to be in the future anyway. So that's why I don't give my name. Uh, sometimes they say my name, but uh, whatever. Anyway, a warehouse for more stuff that the San Jose pot dealers are stealing from people. All the stuff they confiscate. They need more house. They need more room for it. This is this I got to see. They must be they must be taking away people's possessions like the gang they are if they need another warehouse to to house the stuff that they take from from people probably in many cases illegally and to answer Blair Binkman's question how the auction works the dirty shady secret of San Jose pot dealers is they have their own private auction in, in interdepartmental are returning to the council, do we have a motion? So moved. Motion from the vice mayor. Okay. Second from Council Member Cohen, let's vote. Anes? Yes. Alice? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Roscoe? Aye. Davis? Yes. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Jones? Aye. Lucardo? Aye. Thank you. Well, we are so efficient. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to go ahead and uh, take a jump into item 4.2 right before dinner and let's just see if we can make it happen. This is the ordinance prohibiting encouraging spectators to gather at street races and reckless driving exhibitions. There is a brief presentation, I'm told. 
Hi, hi, Chief. Welcome. Hello, Mayor. Uh, yes, we should have um, Captain Trayer on on here shortly with the presentation. If I threw him off by jumping, uh, leaping ahead, I can. We can take it up after dinner if he's if he happens to be out. I know that my taking things out of order may have. See Todd Trayer in the audience by any chance? No. No. Okay. Good time to break for dinner, Mayor. I guess it is uh, apparently. So uh, if anybody sees uh, Ten Trayer out there, then. Uh, Oh, make sure he's having dinner because he'll, he'll have to be back here by 6.30. Uh, okay, uh, actually, I take that back. We have a time certain for the other item, which is 4.1 at 6.30, so he'll have to wait. Anyway, uh, thanks, everybody. Let's take a dinner recess, and we'll be back here at 6.30.